Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 11th episode of the Friday Nightmares podcast. On tonight's show, we will be discussing zombies, reality, and fantasy. I am your host, recording from Swartz Creek, Michigan, Scott Crawford. And with me, as always, is my lovely partner in crime. The queen from the north, Heather Powell. Recording from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. You forgot to mention you're in your horror basement. Oh, I am in my horror basement. It's been a little while since we've, I've recorded down here for it's our show. It's hot as fuck. <laughs> hot as hell, and I've already had it set up down here from when we recorded It's Not Horror. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so here we are, end of June. Happy early Canada Day to my Canadian friends and happy Independence Day to you, Scott, and all my American friends. Thank you. And yes, happy Canada Day to the few Canadians that I know and love and happy Independence Day for everyone here in the U.S. Like, we'll see what happens. Like, there's probably not going to be many events, but hopefully everybody gets to hang out with friends and family and have some cookouts and or in Canada barbecues. Words, barbecues. <laughs> barbecues. <laughs> <Or> BBQs. <laughs> BBQs. Um, yeah, you can all you can all put your, your flags on your houses. Oh so my everyone gosh. knows you're American. I went for a walk today in my <laughs> subdivision and <laughs> apparently there is someone that is very patriotic because their yard was just filled with these miniature American flags all over the place and I'm going, Oh boy. <laughs> we do that maybe on Canada like actually on Canada Day. Like we all wear, like, I was in Walmart, uh, what night was it? Last night, I was getting snacks because I went to a, a pool and hot tub thing. Well, I was the only one in the pool and hot tub. I was actually just telling Scott before we started recording, I spent the night last night going from pool to hot tub, pool to hot tub, like, a total Lucky. basic white bitch. Like, I don't think I could have been any more, like, privileged <laughs> well, <laughs> last night. That was living your best life right there. It was, it was living my best life. But anyway, uh, in Walmart, there's everything's Canada Day, like Canada Day bathing suits, Canada Day sweaters, Canada Day bags. And I always find it hilarious because I, I really don't buy that stuff. Like if there's an event, I'll go and maybe get like a Canada, like a Canada fl- Canadian flag tattoo. And I consider myself pretty proud to be Canadian, but I just find that other stuff really fucking cheesy. And I don't... <laughs> I have no interest in owning it or wearing it, but, you know, whatever floats your boat. Yeah, that's pretty much the same here in the U.S. Like, there's American flag stuff, American apparel everywhere, and then just a giant aisle in almost all grocery stores and other stores of fireworks. Because I was going to ask, uh, do you guys, uh, like, sell fireworks and uh, launch fireworks on Canada Day, kind of like us in America? Yeah, we, we do, but it's not the same as, like, what you guys do, right? Like, I'll be honest, I'm pretty sure, like, 4th of July, y'all, like, get outside and let off fireworks but yeah we usually do but this year it's banned um so there's no sell of fireworks so sale of fireworks so if someone had some from before i'm sure they could let them off but there's no firework displays it's funny they tried to do like a virtual firework display for victoria day weekend because we have fireworks for that too which i don't know if anyone fucking watched that like like i like fireworks don't get me wrong i enjoy them um but i've seen some pretty like high class ones like we have a sister city um so I'm from Burlington, Ontario. There's a sister city that we have in Japan and they came over one year and did a firework presentation for us to music. Um, oh, wow. And we did some stuff for them. Like we went back and forth with this partnership and this was back when I was like 16. And I think all of Burlington, which is a fairly large city, probably the size of Flint, um, went to this event and they closed down streets. Like we had to walk there. I had to walk from my parents' house, which was like 45 minute walk. And it was, it was incredible. So I enjoy fireworks, but like, after you see something like that, you know what I mean? Like everything's like, yeah, right? like, it's great. Don't get me wrong, but I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything this year because I'm not seeing them. Right. Yeah. I, um, cause I love watching the fireworks displays that different cities throw. Like, uh, we have one, uh, a city here called Bay city and Tim and I went there last summer uh, for 4th of July, like last minute decision. Cause we're just like, we both have the day off. We want to do something. Let's go to an event. Bay city's supposed to be well known for their fireworks. Maybe they have some fun activities going on or something. And we get out there and we just kind of drive around. Cause we've been like through Bay city, but never actually visited the city itself. 
And we ended up coming across this pier that led right out into the bay and just beautiful. So we're like, oh, let's go take a walk. And then we we're walking out in this long pier out in the middle of the water. And people were walking by going, oh, if you're here for the fireworks, this is the best spot to be for it. It's like, because they launch it right over there. We're like, oh, sweet. Okay. So we left our car and just walked, I think it was 10 miles that day, just through the city. It's a lot of miles. Yeah. Like we walked to a bar, got a couple drinks, uh, got a nice buzz going, walked across this big old bridge to the actual downtown part of the city and like found this nice pizzeria and a couple other cool places and I took a bunch of pictures and because there was this really cool building. Uh, I think it was uh, Cantonese or something like that restaurant, but it was closed for the day, but it had a picture of this character called Wang Wang. And it's like this little short guy that's like James Bond, but it's a Cantonese movie. And I'm like, is that Wang Wang from the exploitation era of like 70s films? And I looked it up and I'm like, holy shit, it is. And it was actually a restaurant dedicated to that movie. And I I want to go back there just to like go inside and like see if they have it decorated that way or not. But that's cool. Yeah, we got back to the pier and like, yeah, it was a good spot because everybody was there and the fireworks were just phenomenal. It was right, right over the water and it was just beautiful and you could see drones flying like right near the fireworks and everything like that too, like getting pictures of it for people that were in their apartments that couldn't get out into the like closer spots. That's really nice. That's yeah, really and nice. Like, like, and with fireworks for me, I love watching them. I will never spend money on them because I feel to me personally, it's a waste of money because I don't, it's literally lighting your money on fire is how I look at it. <laughs> you probably don't like gambling either. I bet. Do you? Uh, I do gamble just, uh, I don't do it very often. I gamble in other ways, like when I buy my magic, my magic cards and stuff like that, because I can pull a hundred dollar card out of a pack and stuff like that. You and gamble I, with your heart. I do. <laughs> I gamble with my nerddom. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Very, very fun. Well, it's a different look for this summer, but you know what? That's okay. I've been out to patios, which I've been living my best life doing that. Um, I'm just happy that I've been able to go out and do things, you know, like. Yep. Same here first world problems, you know, we're really blessed to live in two countries that we have what we have. And for people that live in states that have been really affected, like up here, you know, Canada, we, uh, Florida has more cases of COVID-19 than all of Canada. Yeah. And in the city that I live in, less than decimal zero, zero point four percent or zero decimal zero, zero four or four percent. I don't even know what that is. Like a percentage of 1% has COVID. So it's very limited here. Not a lot of people have it. A lot of people have recovered. Um, but I know there's areas in the States where it's not, they're not so lucky. So, you know, thinking of those guys too. Yeah. And I'm hoping that, cause you know, Michigan started opening up and I'm hoping everything works out well for us. Cause the numbers have started to rise a little bit here, but only by like a hundred cases more than what we were seeing for the last couple of weeks. So I oh, know that's our- not too bad, right? A hundred, a hundred rising. Like people are gonna, it's gonna grow because people are gonna be going out again, right? Yeah, and I think it has to do with our governor too. She's a lot more strict with, like, she's willing to shut down things to like keep it in control. So I know gyms were supposed to open this week, but she's seen the numbers rising. Uh, gyms and theaters were supposed to open this week, and she's seen the numbers rising. So she said, "I'm pushing it back till July 4th. We'll see what happens in that time, and go from there." Yeah, gyms are difficult. You know what's funny? My gym called me this week, not gym, a person, the YMCA <laughs> that I go to, um, to just see how I was doing. And I'm a real supporter of the YMCA and what they do for the community. Um, right. And, you know, I miss going to the gym. I'm a gym rat. So I really enjoy it. But you know what? Like, it's, it is a cesspool for germs. Like, that's reality. So, yeah. you know, we got to do what's best for everybody right now. And if it's not going to work out, in a gym then that's probably for the best right exactly and after my uh time away from the gym and just doing the stuff here at home i don't know if i'll go back to the gym i'm i'm actually like feeling like i'm making more progress being like doing the stuff that i'm doing here at home yeah you're seeing results yeah and like before i was just building muscle now i'm actually like losing weight because i'm doing more cardio stuff look at that scott's gonna be a hottie by the end of this year 
right? I wish. <laughs> We're going to have to switch to video just so we can get more listeners and Scott can just do it shirtless and shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I record pantless stuff now. <laughs> That's true. And, and each time you tip, just like a cam girl, Scott will take more off. It's very exciting. Yeah, but I'll do it all sexy like with some music. Bum, 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 but it will be the blind guardian because Scott doesn't listen to anything else. Oh my <laughs> so gosh, here we I'll, go again. Help you all like blind guardian because that's what he's going to be stripping to. Or, or music from the early 2000s. That's the other thing that he listens to as well. Yeah, I was going to say we'll find some beats from the early 2000s because right. blind guardian isn't good enough to like strip to. So you got to no. have some beats. <laughs> strip to. <laughs> all right, before we like get into this fucking. I don't know, hole or wherever we're going with this conversation. <laughs> Why don't we get, you don't have that many movies to talk about. Um, well, you have watched more 2020s. <sighs> ha ha, I am caught up to you now. Yeah, I don't, I don't really like it. But it's not fair because some of these movies weren't on Shutter, And I just feel it, like that's. And that, that really bums me out. I was so. It wanted- bums you out, huh? <laughs> well, I mean, it does because I really want, I was really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on one of these films. Uh, well, hopefully I get to see the one that you're talking about. I know which one it is, because you haven't talked about the other ones. So. <laughs> Obviously, so you don't give a shit about what I think about the other ones. I think there was one that you saw on Tubi that I could have watched, but after your ra- your raving review, I figured I'd just uh, <laughs> skip that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's just one that I'm going to touch on briefly, because you already brought it up, but um, you don't have good taste, so <laughs> we feel the need to bring it up again. <laughs> Um, the movie is Scare Package 2020. I liked it a lot. So I know Scott talked about this last week, I think, or yeah. last week or last time we recorded. And I, I watched it with very low expectations because in all fairness to you, Scott, you were not the only one who did not like it. So as much as I razz you and tease you, uh, your opinion was among the minor- the majority. Sorry, the majority. I thought it was funny. Now, I have the humor of equivalent of a 10-year-old boy. So I think that... <laughs> I found there was one part that I thought was really funny. It's like at the beginning, the beginning sequence and our main character shows up and he's driving this convertible and the convertible comes up and it's a Freddy. Yes. I love right? that. I thought that was, I thought it was a great call to nightmare on Elm street. <laughs> it was really funny. I thought all of the skits were funny. I, one of my favorite was one where a girl catches the guy that's trying to kill her and um, kills all her boyfriends every time she's about to have sex with them and the whole diatribe that goes on with that I thought was... Okay, yeah, that one I actually enjoyed too. I forgot about that one. Oh my god, I thought it was so funny. Um, at the end, the wraparound, uh, Joe Bob was in it. Joe Bob Briggs, right, um, was in it. I thought that was really cool. Anyway, I, I thought it was really funny. I really enjoyed it. They're covering it on Fresh Cuts next week and I really enjoy listening to people's thoughts on it. Uh, Rebecca from the in the Mike Madness, I guess, knows some of the directors that made some of the short films, so she's going to be talking about it, hopefully, if she's on that episode, uh, which I think is cool. So, I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was funny. I I have that similar sense of humor, though. I love the fact that it was in an old-school video store <laughs> that was filmed in, and, like, the main characters are so over-the-top goofy that I just thought it was really funny. Um, yeah, yeah, I enjoyed. Yeah, because I, I like the wraparound and, like, I'd say about half the stories I really enjoyed and the others I didn't hate. I just thought were okay. I loved all the stories. I know. I, I know they were you all did. Funny. I like the chick one was hilarious too with the like the cursed fucking lollipop or whatever. I, <laughs> see, I had to ask you what the trope was on that one. Cause I was so confused. I'm like, I don't get what this is supposed to be. Uh, it was so like over the top fucking girls go crazy fucking shit it was great it was cultish shit anyway i thought it was really funny and how the killer keeps coming back and then he tries to kill him with kindness and shit like (laughs) and he shaves his head i'm getting so many spots away the scene where he shaves his head and he looks like um cory cory feldman from uh cory feldman right oh yeah from friday oh my god i was (laughs) what he says his lines that he says at that part are so funny like it's just i don't know how you weren't dying at that scene like i was just i thought i was gonna like fall off my chair i was laughing so hard but i don't know maybe it was just the mood i was in when i watched it but i thought it was really funny yeah like i said i enjoyed a decent chunk of it i probably rated it a little harshly but yeah i I still thought it was pretty good like for an Mm -hmm. anthology like i just had some issues with some well, that's because you're no heart. So anyway, yeah. I <laughs> I'm just I'm just hugs and tugs. <laughs> it's a Care Bear reference. People are probably like hugs it. and tugs, Heather. <laughs> Viewership just went up. All right, so. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, Scott, why don't you talk about our next bad boy that we watched last weekend? All right. So this movie, uh, it goes by two different titles. Um, one is by the title Eight, which makes sense once you watch the movie. Uh, then the second title is the more Americanized version title, and I just found it very generic, but it's called The Soul Collector. Which sounds like a Wes Craven film from the early 2000s. <laughs> it does. It sounds so generic. It's a bunch of teenagers, and there's someone after their soul. Will he finish his collection? <laughs> But yeah, this is a, uh, I think this might be my first ever South African horror film that I've watched. Oh, nice. Yeah, I think it's my first two. I tried to watch another one, but I, I just couldn't get into it. But yeah, this one is about this guy that carries around the sack. It's very uh, folklorish. Yeah, it's very folklorish. And he carries around this like sack, like this knapsack made of flesh that carries in it like a creature. I don't want to say what the creature is because of spoilers, but... He pretty much walks around and uh, collects the souls of the people that are suffering and dying. And he ends up uh, befriending this little girl at this farmhouse that just moved in. And the story kind of just unravels from there. Like, I, we watched a version that I uh, was kind of pirated. So I, there was a... Uh, some... <laughs> <Yarr. Sorry. laughs> it's a really great day here at Friday Night Nerds, anyway. But there was a uh, dialogue that was spoken in the African language and there was no subtitles, which I think that was where a lot of the folklore background story comes from. So there's, I want to rewatch it, but I really loved this movie. It was a really solid film. I think it's funny that we're so white that we don't even know which language it was because there's yeah. like probably 50 dialects in the continent or in South Africa alone, let alone other kind like like let alone the continent of africa for example like <laughs> and we're so sort of like language african like we have no idea what it actually is so we apologize if someone knows what that language is scott and i are not that uh, cultured to know right. um unfortunately but i agree i thought it was some great storytelling the acting was awesome the practical effects were very good um very emotional story a very emotional story and um that's great. You know, I, I personally enjoy emotional storytelling and I, I thought it was a great watch. I think this is some, you know, I've heard people go on that 2020 has been a bad year for films. And then you ask them how many they've seen and they've seen 10. Right. And I never in a million years thought I'd be one of these people that are like, okay, you need to watch more movies, but you do like, don't tell me that 2020 is a bad year for film. Then you've watched 10 movies. Yeah, exactly. Especially, <laughs> especially when those 10 movies, like, 60% of them are the theatrical releases we got early in the year, and there weren't that many good theatrical releases this year. No, like Invisible Man was a great film, don't get me wrong, but yeah, it's that was like my the top hi- 10. Yeah, and I was saying, I think that was the highlight. That was like well, the highest. Well, and Underwater, I'd say, was really good too. Like, those yeah. are both solid films, but like, you know, Fantasy Island, don't don't put that as a, you know, it's a fun little film. Like, it's not a bad film, but it's definitely what I go, oh man, Fantasy Island, that totally tops, like, the the quality of this year no you know and i think you got to expand to international films like don't and i'm not saying that people are afraid of subtitles but but look outside of the typical stuff that you see on you know shutter or go into netflix and look at what's been released do a little bit of digging listen to podcasts and what they're listening to listen to the ross and round table with mark nato you know man has watched 300 films so far like makes you and i at 81 and i don't know what you're at now yep 81 exactly with 81 you. you know like that's why i feel like when people tell me this year's been a horrible year i get really mad because i'm like well then no one hasn't <laughs> yeah because um <laughs> i think the issue is a lot of the films that we're seeing are only on these streaming platforms or VOD releases. And there's not a good way to like keep track of what is coming out. Cause some places like some websites will just say, Oh, here's what's new to shutter. Oh, another website will be like, Oh, here's what's new to Netflix. And well, shit, a lot of the stuff on Netflix, I didn't even know about until you what you found some stuff yeah. and told me about it. Yeah. Like, it's, but if I think you it's just hard to podcasts. To you don't really have an excuse. Because yeah. there's lots of podcasts out there that are covering this stuff now, right? Um, so, you know, and of course, like, if you're just not interested, I'm not trying to shoot on anybody, like, if you're not interested. But I, I think that if you've only watched 10 films, you can't say this has been a poor year. 
Like you really right. can't. Like that's to me not a fair statement because you're not basing it off of anything. You're basing it off of 10 films that you've watched when, you know, we have someone like Mark Nato that's watched 300. Now out of right. that 300, obviously there's going to be films that aren't that good. But if we watched 81 and both of us have a solid top 10 that we're comfortable with and then, oh man, how are we going to rank things in our 10 to 20? Like what is our 11 to 20? What does that say about this year? Right, exactly. Because yeah. I would say like my top 20 is like films I would absolutely recommend. Like I just oh, yeah, love absolutely. everything in the top 20 for sure. Absolutely, right? I couldn't agree more. So I think that people just need to be a little more open-minded, um, which is what we're going to do when we get into our next one here. Yeah. So the next film that I want to talk about briefly is Dead Sound. So Dead yep. Sound it was something that you watched back in, I don't know, a while ago. Yeah, I'd say it's probably like two or three episodes back now. About that, right? So I watched it the other night. I really liked it. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, like I, went, I would say it's probably more thriller than it is horror, but it was a really enjoyable film. I, I thought the acting was decent. I thought the way the characters reacted in the situation that they were in was valid. It handled some pretty heavy issues about addiction, um, some very tense scenes where people are forced to take drugs and you don't yeah. know what's going to happen to them. Um, uh, overall like easy watch and for uncorked i would say probably the best uncorked film i've ever seen yeah this is right up there with the dinner party for me because you know yeah. i really love the dinner party and like it's another one of those uh where it's all about the character like the characters and these actors all did a really good job and it was uh self-contained isolation horror nothing like super big budget or anything like that but it like they worked with what they had for their budget and it shows and they did a great job with it Absolutely. It, anyway, I'm glad that you, you mentioned it before and that you had found it and that we watched it because it was really a good film. Yeah, I, I definitely recommend that one. Like, I think it might be like in my top 25, top 30. Oh, Heather is getting her basic white girl on. Yeah, I got my Starbucks. <laughs> this is why we should switch the video and everyone can see how pretentious I am with my nails done and realize that you really are the nicer one. <laughs> you're, but you're the better looking one. Mm. Oh, that's so nice of you to say. He's just saying that because he's trying to build up my self-esteem because Brandon wants him more than me. Anyway, <laughs> on to the next film. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, this one is Warning, Do Not Play. We, uh, watched, uh, we watched this separately at different times, but uh, both watched it within our time span, but it was on Shudder. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, this is a South Korean horror film that's along the lines of uh, The Ring, where it's a uh, cursed film that was uh shown at this like film festival and i think people got really sick and like had heart attacks and stuff like that and then the film just got lost and this lady was trying to i think she was trying to do either documentary or another film herself and she wanted to find this film she's a screenwriter it. so she's yeah. trying so i listened to the fresh cuts episode on this the other day and it really okay. helped um so she was a screenwriter and she had to get a screenplay in so she was using this film as inspiration I think that's how it started, but obviously it goes down a sinister path. Yep, and it's uh, out of obsession. You know, and I would say for uh, South Korean films, like I, I've watched a handful. I'm no expert. I was going to be on that Fresh Cuts episode, but I didn't feel confident enough in my knowledge of South Korean films to be on there, especially when you're on with someone like Don... Don and Ellie, who oh, yeah. you know, is extremely knowledgeable, and I learned a lot from him in Venom, listening to it, and Mike as well. So I'm, I was glad that I listened to it after I watched it. I would honestly, yeah, I, I, they say it's not the best South Korean movie, like it's decent, uh, but I think it's better than any ghost story we've seen come out of America or Canada this year. Like I haven't seen any like domestic films, ghost story wise, that have been good. Like the turning was crap, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, for a ghost story. I, you know, props to some of the parts of that movie, but as a ghost story, it wasn't entertaining at all. And the other like low budget ghost stories I've seen, I, I haven't enjoyed them. Like I've, I thought they were stupid. The grudge. Well I got the grudge. Um it's, yeah. <laughs> get the grudge came out this year or the the reboot or whatever. Um the ghost that can travel from Japan to Canada first class on you know, <laughs> Air Canada or Delta or whatever it flew on. But yeah, honestly, I think for a ghost story, it's pretty entertaining. Yeah, and this one, like, and most ghost stories aren't very violent. There's a few of them, but this one had some, like, pretty vicious uh, violence in it, too. Yeah, absolutely. No, I really, I really enjoyed it. Um, I definitely recommend it. It's on Shudder. You know, compared to other stuff on Shudder, like, this is definitely... If you want to kind of just expand your horizons of international films, this is a very easy film to watch. It's short. I think it's only like 85 minutes. 
It's not a long watch. You know, the characters are, and you care what happens to them. Like, I was, I did feel an anxiety at certain points for certain characters. Like, you cared. So. Yeah, I was the exact same way. Like, I yeah. thought this was a really well done uh, ghost story, and the acting was all really good. Because, yeah, like you said, you feel for the characters, and it's the actors that bring that out of them. Like, the writing and, or the dialogue and the characters. But yeah, I recommend this one. It's definitely worth a watch. I really enjoyed it. Um, but I guess, yeah, we can jump on to our... Oh, I guess we do the next one, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, sorry. Um, you should have left 2020. You should have left and not watched this movie, is what actually the rest of it's supposed to say, but they took that out of the title. I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I don't know. Kevin Bacon was fine in this. I, a lot of people have, like, criticized the casting for this one with... Amanda Seyfried, Seyfried yep. and Kevin Bacon. I thought they were fine. Like, I didn't have a beef with them as a couple. I thought that they were okay. Um, I just found the story, like, so basic bitch and just so predictable and just so, I don't know. I didn't think it was creative. I didn't think it was anything super special. Like, it was kind of just there. I wouldn't recommend spending $20 on it. Yeah, because this is one of those films from Blumhouse that's along the lines of The Hunt and Invisible Man, where it was, since theaters are closed, this was supposed to go to go theatrical. So cool of them to release it and uh, allow you to rent it for nineteen ninety nine. But I would not recommend it. To tell you the truth, when I was looking at this list of movies that we're talking about, I came across this title and went, "Oh, Heather watched a movie I haven't heard of." Forgetting that this is the movie I <laughs> what this movie was. We watched this movie together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just last, just literally last week. That and tells had, you how memorable it was for Scott. <laughs> yeah, it was just so middle of the road. Like, it was like, totally, I feel like it was just like, look, we got Kevin Bacon. You should like this movie. <laughs> yeah, we got Kevin Bacon and Amanda Seyfried, like very well-known actors. You should like ha- be happy and love this movie. And, and, they, yeah. and they were fine. Okay. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were not the issue. It was. It was just the story. It was just poor writing, and even the little girl was fine. She was actually pretty cute. The the young lady that's in it. Um, and the character is like, oh my god, I almost want to give spoilers because I think the movie's so stupid. Not what happens, but it's just so predictable. You know, like it, it, none of this was a surprise. Like it was just. You know, if you've seen enough horror movies, you've seen this plot. Yeah, and you and I both called this one within, <laughs> yeah. like, 20 minutes of the movie. <laughs> oh, my God. Though I will, like, and, and I felt like they tried to do dream sequences that weren't dream sequences, but you weren't sure if they were dream sequences. <laughs> like, they were just so, like, I want to hear Venom watch this movie because I feel like he's going to go over on how stupid it is. I can just hear him getting angry in my head. Um, yeah, <laughs> I could totally see it. Uh, but yeah, like I just, yet again, like I'm super glad I didn't go to the theater and drop a bunch of money on popcorn and pop to watch this. Like, let me tell you that much. Um, well, I probably actually wouldn't have minded cause I would have only spent five bucks for the movie. And then like, I would have actually enjoyed it just for the fact that I had popcorn and pop. <laughs> yeah, fair, fair. But yeah, like, I think if you are a big Kevin Bacon fan, it's worth a watch. He looks great, you know, for a gentleman that's, I think 60, like, yeah. damn. Like, man takes care of himself. Amanda Siegfried is a beautiful young lady. Well, not young. I guess she's the same age as me, probably. She's probably in her 30s. Um, beautiful woman. And they're great. Like, if you're fans of them, I think you'll enjoy the film. But I, I yeah. I wouldn't. And I, if you're a fan of. you could watch, right? Yeah, and I was saying, and if you're a fan of, like, the haunted house type storylines. <sighs> yeah, I guess. But- yeah, it's such I, a shitty a haunted house. It's such a shitty haunted house storyline. Like it's not even like the turning that felt like I was going through some like cheap haunted castle in Niagara Falls. Like <laughs> right. this one was just stupid. Like it was and it wasn't even scary. Like I was like, it was just dumb. It was just and I feel like they were trying to do this deep concept, but they couldn't like seal the deal. <laughs> no, they could not. Like <laughs> I think you and I rolled our eyes like to the point where they almost fell out of our head. <laughs> oh, like, I so badly want to give spoilers. I almost wish this was fresh cut so I could go off on what my theory is on what happened at the beginning in the first 15 minutes You're and right. how that and how I think they never went back to that, but that's actually what happened and like anyway. This isn't uh, the time or the place. I don't know. Maybe if we cover like haunted house, like actual haunted places, not like the haunted house episode we did before, like haunted right. places. Maybe we can bring this in just so I can like spoil it and give my theories behind it. But um but yeah, anyway. 
Uh, yeah, so it looks like the next three are all on me and this one. Yeah, yeah, look at you. <laughs> my, name, <laughs> my name's Scott. I watched the 2020 movies on my own. Wow. Okay, I, Scott. Yeah, go ahead. I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts. It's good. I, I, it's because I'm popular. I know. Whatever. I'm going to drink my Starbucks. <laughs> uh, so this next one uh, is called The Clearing, and this was also another 2020 watch, and I was uh, surprised, but the app Crackle uh, apparently is starting to do their own exclusive original content. Oh. And I don't even remember how I came across this. I think it was just some website I was looking up, trying to look up new 2020 horror films. And this one popped up saying like, check out the clearing on Crackle. And I'm like, well, I already have the Crackle app. Why not? I'll look into it. And it's basically about a father that takes his daughter out for like a camping trip and they take their RV and go to like this camping com commune and they're just out there and then all of a sudden a zombie uh, virus strikes and everybody's like Damn. yeah and like zombies just start attacking and they're like the fast paced zombies the little girl ends up like leaving in the morning because she's uh, in Girl Scouts and she's trying to earn one of her badges so she goes out <laughs> oh. in the morning to uh, find like certain flowers or something like that and then that's when the zombies strike and so it's basically like this father is stuck in this RV surrounded by these zombies and can see his daughter out in the distance in the wilderness, like kind of sneaking around, but he can't get to her. And like, it's basically a story about how am I getting back to my daughter? And Shit, how am this I sounds good. Safe? It was, yeah, I was really impressed with this. Like it's very uh, minimal cast besides obviously the zombies. Uh, it's very tense. Sounds like they used their budget well there. Like that's they a simple, really did. you can do zombie makeup. You know, and zombies can look differently, right? Like you can just have people that look really mad or you can yeah. do some really um, elaborate shit. So I think that's really, really cool. Yeah. And they, it starts off like right away. Oh, and really? Like, nice. Yeah, and then, and then they kind of tell you like backstory stuff in between as the father is just like trying to struggle to survive on his own. Because obviously when you're in an RV camping, you're going to run out of supplies eventually because there's not a, you don't go there for like a long-term thing. But yeah, this is... A high recommend for me. This is a really good, like, very personal style uh, zombie film. And uh, on Crackle app, you say? So do you have to download the app? Yep. Which the which everything with Crackle is free. You just got to deal with commercials. You know, I didn't know this, and I feel like you didn't tell me, so you could catch up. Ah, uh, actually, I did message you a week or two before when I first heard about this movie and said, "Hey, you should look into the app Crackle." And you're like, "Oh, I'll do that." And then that was the last time. I, I don't about believe it. you. I, I think can, you're just making it up. I could actually, you know what? I will go back at our messages. I'll screenshot it and share it to our Facebook page. <laughs> Be like, this is make sure there's nothing else inappropriate. In the right. <laughs> Not that Scott and I discuss inappropriate things. Our no. Messages are always very, very PC, and we love everybody. So everything's just positive all the time. Um, oh, that sounds good, though. I'm, I'm really pleased to hear a plot like that. Yet again, I like these plots that are simplistic and that match people's budget and what their resources are. Like, yeah. Man, am I growing in respect for that this year. Yeah, and I was really imp impressed with the acting in this, too. The father and the really? daughter. Yeah, they did a really good job. Like, you could, you would, you feel for them. Like, it was, uh, it definitely pulled on your heartstrings. Good. Cool. That's exciting. Thanks for sharing yeah. that one. Yep, and I'll save the best for last, and I'll just go with uh, the girl in the crawl space for Which right is now. actually based on Scott's story, because he has the chick that he keeps in the crawl space. <laughs> hey! I said, be quiet. I'm recording a podcast. <laughs> Actually, it's so unrealistic. Scott would be the person kept on the cross page. <laughs> well, that's why I'm saying I'm telling them above me to stay quiet because I'm trying to record a podcast. <laughs> well, that's right, because you're in the cross space. That's true. Um, oh. uh, yeah, this one was uh, free on Tubi, and I just kind of scrolled through and seen it. And I'm like, oh, I'll give it a shot. I mean, maybe I'll find a hidden gem. You're like, I just got to catch up to Heather. <laughs> Any excuse I can. I'm almost uh, there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no. Avoid this movie. Good Lord. It was an hour and 20 minutes. It could have been, like, a 40-minute movie. Like, uh, it's about, like, I, I'm trying to think of how to go about this. Like, it's about a woman that comes back to her old hometown. Apparently, she is a therapist, and she got in trouble for helping someone that she knows personally in her job, like in the city she was in. So she comes back to this small town 
and goes and does the exact same thing again where she's helping these small town people out that she's known since she's grown up <laughs> so that's a dumb idea wow she sounds really smart yeah and <laughs> um but it's basically about like they're trying to like just discuss about this uh guy that kidnapped women and hid them in a crawl space and like she's just trying to find like the woman is still alive that was in this crawl space so she's trying to like get to kind of the bottom of what was going on there because it happened like a couple years ago and the girl's still not right in the head from it obviously and so she's just trying to like figure out and try to find ways to get her to talk about it she's not opening up but man the uh, the exposition heavy dialogue in this is so ridiculous like like the cop that shows up he's known her since she was a little girl he goes oh uh why'd you come back Oh, well, you know, because my father died, so I wanted to come back to this house. Oh, your fa- that's right, your father died from this, and it's been so long since you've been to this house. Like, it's just these, the convenient dialogue. Plot, and, the dialogue and the convenient plot points, right? Yeah, and the dialogue between the two of them, it's just like, here, let me explain everything to you, even though you can already see what's going on on the screen, but we're going to make sure, because the audience is dumb, and we need to tell you this. It's, oh, it was insulting. I got a better crawl space movie. What's there that? once was a, a young girl named Heather and her parents had a crawl space. And what she used to do with her girlfriends is they would go all the way to the back corner of this crawl space, which was on the other end of the house. And there would be lights and we would tell scary stories. And then we would dare each other to stay behind in the dark while all the lights were turned out and crawl out. That's awesome. And I did it. And I still am scared of the crawl space in my parents' house. I oh, used to wow. think fucking shit was going to come out of that all the time and then one day we found writing on the wall in there which were from the children that used to live there before okay like we're not but you know when you're eight you make up right right so we made up these stories about these kids that lived there before and they got locked in the crawl space but anyway crawl spaces are pretty fucking creepy but that movie sounds horrible sounds like a lifetime film it it felt like one and actually that kind of brings up a story for me because speaking of crawl spaces when i was a kid uh my parents had one and the door to and they kept you in there Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> but, no, but no, it almost opened up like a cellar door. It was like this big square door. Yeah. And it was on the floor in my toy room. And so, <laughs> Okay, Scott, where are we going with this story? <laughs> so instead of going down there with friends and telling spooky stories, I would open it up, crawl down into the crawl space with all my G.I. Joes and start playing G.I. Joe in the crawl space and would go all the way to the back and buy a, uh, one of the ground level windows and I would always try to scare my stepdad by just, like, banging on it when he walked by. But, yeah, I would go down there by myself and just play G.I. Joes and, like, uh, micro machines and stuff like that in the dirt. This is where we find out that Scott actually had a twin that, like, they kept in the crawl space, like, people under the stairs and shit. Like, I, <laughs> no, that's, like, completely separate. Never mind. Different movies, different concepts. Oh, he's trying oh. to pretend like I called him out on something. You should all oh, see right. his face right now. Like, he actually has a twin that he killed. Like, first of all, if there was a twin, it would have killed Scott, okay? <laughs> Scott would have killed the twin. <laughs> you've done it. You've opened the doors of my memory. <laughs> I've completely locked that away. Yeah, with all the weedy smoke, that's the other issue. <laughs> you cleared Super. out the weed smoke, and I see now. <laughs> now I can see I had this twin that lived in the call space. All right, yeah. So anyway, this is a non-recommend from Scott, and now we have one more. Yes, and this is my number one movie of the year now, and it is the most dumbest title in the world, uh, but it is Ghost Killers versus Bloody Mary, and well, unfortunately, apparently this is not on Canadian Shudder, and mm-hmm. it's only on the U.S. Shudder, which is why I was disappointed that Heather couldn't watch it, because I was really looking forward to hearing her thoughts. Uh-huh. <laughs> but <laughs> holy crap, I... I heard from, I think it was Mark Nato months ago that he thought like, he's like, this is a dumb title, but it's a very entertaining movie. I, so I went into it going, okay, we'll see what, like what this is about. Cause Mark Nato and I agree and disagree on certain films. And yeah, this is about these ghost hunter wannabes that are uh, just trying to be popular on YouTube, faking everything just to get views. So and... they're paranormal investigators that are going to a haunted house. <laughs> Yep, like the ba- okay. the plot the plot is so basic, bitch. <laughs> it's it's also Brazilian. It's a for oh, my first cool. Brazilian horror film that I've seen. So they're speaking Your first. Portuguese. Yes, my first. 
but it's in uh, Portuguese. But no, it's like these ghost hunters are like, we're not having any success on being popular on these YouTube sites. And then they get a call about um, this ghost that appeared in this high school. And the teacher's like, or the principal's like, yeah, this, we're just doing this to calm the students down because there's a rumor that Bloody Mary got released. And like the students are all paranoid, but it's a bunch of bull crap. But students were talking about you guys. So we wanted to like hire you so you can put on this show to make it look like it's all clear. And they go, they're going, all right, yeah, so we'll just pretend everything. And well, when they realize that Bloody Mary is real, this is when the movie just goes batshit insane. Crazy. The only way I can compare it is it is way over the top violent and hilarious and offensive along the lines of the Evil Dead and Deathgasm. If you like the humor that's in those two films with the crazy over the top amounts of violence and gore, this will be your type of film because I did not expect any of this when I came into it. It's freaking hilarious. Like I was laughing my ass off multiple times to the point where my roommate came out going, what the hell is so funny? And I just pointed at the screen, not even being able to talk because I'm laughing so hard. And he's just going, oh, and he just walks away. But man, it is just so. So what you're saying is that you do laugh at things sometimes. I do. I do. Mm. And this one, it just, it had me in tears. And like, I, the gore was just way over the top. A lot of practical effects, which was really awesome. Awesome. Like, this is a high, high, high recommend for me. And I got to find a way to get you to watch this. So. I feel like you only say it's a high recommend because I can't see it. Yes, that is the only reason. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm hoping, like, you know, worst case scenario, you can't watch it, like, on your own, that, you know, the border's open and you get to visit or whatever, and I can have you watch it then. Like, well, that sounds like our... an even... I feel like a zombie ap- apocalypse is more <laughs> likely to happen than that at this point. <laughs> borders yes. opening what are you talking about we'll never it's, have open borders again <laughs> it's so true but like if it does happen before the end of the year and like we're doing our year-end watch just kind of catching up i want to have you watch this yeah i have to so i don't have to hear you talk about it for like 20 minutes in our year-end show this this may be our new uh gremlins uh topic i'll just bring this up every episode <laughs> uh but yeah, that's the end of the 2020 watches. So I guess we can uh, jump on into the older movies that we watched. We only have a few of these. Yeah, because um, the rest of them were all zombie films <laughs> that we're yeah. going to talk about later. <laughs> exactly. Um, so the few non-zombie films I watched was, first one was Wishmaster. Oh, I love this From movie. 1997. And, uh, you know, like, I really like Wes Craven, but I haven't seen all Wes Craven films. And I feel like people, like, don't think that's your favorite director if you haven't seen all their films. And I guess that's fair. I, I guess I just didn't. So anyway, I watched it. And I enjoyed it. I thought the, the beginning, I was like, oh, my God, is this, like, The Mummy? And it was just actually just The Mummy cut as Wishmaster because it starts off very, like, how The Mummy starts off. The Brendan Fraser one, the good one, not the Tom Cruise one. Um, but yeah, it gets better. Like as the movie progresses, I enjoyed it more. I particularly find the Wishmaster quite handsome when he takes his, uh, human form. Yeah. He is Um, very, uh, seductive and his voice is is sexy. I'd be like, I wish for you (laughs) to turn into a different kind of movie. (laughs) Um, (laughs) the porn master. (laughs) Right. Anyway, God, I'm such a horn dog. Anyway, um, but yeah, it was it was good, and like I like how it ends. Like the the climax was really good, and uh, enjoyed the guest spots in it. King Hodder was in it. I thought that was kind of cool. Yep. Um, yeah. Sorry, were you gonna say something? I was saying the Robert England, of course. Yes, of course. Which is like the moment I saw him, I was like, Robert, <laughs> you're here. <laughs> finally anyway yeah I, I enjoyed it you know what it was a fun watch it was on monday night and i had spent the day watching some heavy movies so it was nice to watch something light and fluffy and it was light and fluffy like it was you know it, it didn't take a lot of thinking I didn't have to put on my thinking cap for that one it was a pretty basic film so and then i was gonna watch the sequel <laughs> i looked at what it was about it was like Wishmaster, or um i can't remember the name of the demon or whatever ends up in a jail i'm like nope <laughs> yeah, that one's actually that one is actually good. I would say but obviously. You? Okay. Part one is better, but part two I like, and then part three and four just don't even bother. Mm. But uh, no, there's a reason why he like gets brought into the jail. It makes makes sense. Oh, does it? Okay. I just I saw the synopsis and I was like, you know, I'm not feeling that right now. I had to watch some other 
amazing zombie movies, which we'll get to later, <laughs> that um, definitely won my heart over for sure. And then, do you mind if I just hammer these out? Oh, go for it. Yeah, thanks. All right. So, <laughs> I'll well, allow it. Thank you, boss. Um, the next one was a great documentary that's on Shutter, and it's called Why Horror? And it's a Canadian documentary. The gentleman goes to the University of Toronto and talks about conferences in Canada, which are horror cons in Canada, which I really love. So, which makes sense why you uh, were really fascinated with this documentary and told me to. I watch know it. exactly. <laughs> I was like, it's Canadian. <laughs> I have to love it. Though I was a little disappointed it wasn't Christian from exploding he exploding hmm. heads. Like that means there's another Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> that likes horror well moods is out in in bc but like and wills in quebec but i didn't know there was more than like four of us so that kind of just changes <laughs> everything um but yeah i really i thought it was really great the psychology stuff that they put into it the testing they put into it his discussion of you know why do people get into horror and how that develops your your taste and and it was just a really really well put together thoughtful documentary i would say for any horror fan it's worth the watch um if you've had people question your sanity or your taste in horror for whatever reason i not that you need justification but i think that it provides some really good valid uh points as to why we enjoy it yeah and because i watched this like i think you told me to watch it like i watched it the very next day at work and yeah i I thought this was really fascinating, especially the tests. I thought were yeah. really cool and unique. Um, like they do a test where it's like seeing about like men and women, how they react in theaters to scary films and like how the guy wants to kind of be like the, oh, I'll be your, uh, I'll be your uh, brick that you can hold on to like for your safety. And like the women want someone they can cling to. And they were trying to test that theory on how that worked. And then the one where they uh, do the scan with his mother and him. Yeah, where they're doing that test to like one person that loves horror films and one that's that gets scared easily, and I thought that was really cool. This would have been a uh, interesting documentary to watch before we did our very first episode on what is considered horror. It would have been really good, and you know, it's funny because I also like to go to movies and cuddle up with dudes, but that's because I want to get laid at the end of the movie. Um, so do I. Is, that's why I cuddle yeah. up with dudes, right? Like you know. I'm uh, I'm down with that. I like to pretend to be scared, so I'm like, mm -hmm, take care of me. <laughs> um, but no, it was it was a really good documentary. I enjoyed it a lot. And finally, I watched a classic that I was so embarrassed that I never saw this movie. Uh, just didn't happen, I guess. And then it was an American Werewolf in London. And oh, this movie is so amazing. Yeah, and now I feel like a real horror fan. You know, just started watching this movie this year, according to Brandon Orlick from Exploding Heads. So this has been a big <laughs> year for me. Um, and I loved it. Like, it, I love the main character. He's definitely my boyfriend. Um, if I could go back to 1981, he would be my boyfriend. Yep. Um, he's so sweet. And he's so cute. And, you know, shit. Shit goes wrong for him. Um, and just a little the, bit. The love story that's in there, I could take or leave. Like, I love when people know each other for like 48 hours and they're like, I'm in love with you. Like, <laughs> right. I just think that's a little vomit worthy, but um, you're in lust with each other. That's what you are. You're in lust with each other. Exactly. Um, and that's okay. Lust is a lot of fun, but that's, that's what's going down. But yeah, I loved it. If you haven't seen it, definitely best transition into a werewolf that I've ever seen before. I see why it's praised. Um, obviously, there's some issues issues behind the director now um because i think this was the same director that did the twilight zone yep john landis and uh when i watched the curse film i learned things about that twilight movie that i didn't uh twilight zone movie that i didn't want to know it was pretty hard to watch the curse documentary shows some footage that is pretty intense actually yeah um few things make me gasp and cover my mouth and that and that did so but you know i guess if you remove if you have feelings on that situation, if we remove that and just watch this movie, it's it's a it's a classic. You definitely got to check it out, and I'm really glad that I did. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you did because I I loved uh, getting your reactions like in real time when you were messaging me when you were oh, watching. Oh yeah, like it. how he was going to be my boyfriend. That was my yes. that's probably what I said and, the most. And well, and then uh, his best friend and like the like you were just like surprised and like how decomposed he kept. Oh man, being she and... got kept getting worse and worse for that dude. He kept getting more and more decomposed yeah that poor guy <laughs> right and and then like i guess this is a spoiler but it's a 1981 film and then when they're all in the movie theater like giving him shit like all the people that he's killed like i thought that was really and it's like a porn theater the porn theater was hilarious too like what a funny like a group of people getting together to watch porn like i just right. think they're really funny 
like i don't know i figure that's like an individual or a couple thing or like whether you're a couple or not like i couldn't see myself going to a porn theater with a bunch of strangers and all being like all right let's watch this porno like it just seems odd yeah, but... yeah, very awkward and... yeah but i guess if you like that thing you like that thing right like right i mean no you. no judging for me it just it's we don't judge on friday me. nightmares we're all about whatever you choose to do well we judge each other yeah well, that's what else it. we judge each other it's true <laughs> uh yeah then i only watched well i watched technically more and i'll bring up one of them because it was something you watched last week that's not on this list but just to kind of uh redeem myself a little I ended up watching Girls with Balls, and well, I had a blast with this movie. Did and you really, or did you only say off. you did because you have no soul? I loved this movie. No soul. No soul. But I still love this movie. <laughs> <laughs> this was just freaking hilarious. Uh, I loved every one of the characters. Um, I was not a fan of the. Uh, the coach at first because he was just so over the top and annoying (laughs) but at the same time that was his character and he was supposed to be and as the movie went on i liked him more did you like his line he gave about deliverance yes (laughs) that was great (laughs) (laughs) and just a lot of the movie references they brought up throughout this whole entire thing it was so funny Oh. oh my god it's i i love that movie i i think if i'm ever having a bad day i'm gonna put that on a little monsters That's yeah so i can hilarious. see why you would especially with this movie because oh my god like it just was like it's so goofy right it is it was just <laughs> funny as hell and, oh man well once again french french know how to do it because that was another french film and man that was a great movie my favorite is at the beginning and this is not too big of a spoiler but when like they're at the volleyball game and the one girl's talking shit to the other girl about giving her boyfriend a hand job <laughs> shit like that like it's just, yeah it's just funny like it's just, i thought it was hilarious like i really oh. thought that was but it's something i would do like i would be like yeah I, Anyway, I'll try to watch what I say, but I would, I would probably say something worse than that. Um, <laughs> some chick if I was smack talking, but anyway. Um, yeah, I, uh, fun. I, I was wondering if people were wondering what was wrong with me because I was watching it at work with the uh, overdubbed, and I like, I'm surprised no one heard me cackling in my office while I was working. <laughs> Shit wasn't funny, right? Um, oh, <laughs> that line man. about deliverance, I to, and I know you've seen it, deliverance. So that's why yeah. I you, you're gonna love that line. It's that so was good. great. It was, yeah, that was. So anyone that hasn't seen Girls with Balls, it, it's on Netflix. Check it out. Don't look it up on Google like one of our friends did, because you get different types of videos. <laughs> well, or I mean, you could do that too. Whatever. Or if you want to do that, I mean, we don't judge a Friday nightmares. We don't judge. Nope. I'm just giving heads up. That may not be what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. If that's where you're typing it. But then one that I ended up uh, checking out that my uh, buddy Randall suggested I see is The Last Lovecraft, Relic of Cthulhu. Ugh. Yes. Oh. This one I think you would love because it's more uh, horror comedy and it's not like the, oh, it's so deep Lovecraft stuff. It's, oh, and it's, it's a monster that nobody understands. Exactly. The ending's it's not. so deep. Yeah, it's, <laughs> It is literally none of that. It's basically this guy uh, realizes that he is the ancestor of H.P. Lovecraft, and he is. Oh my god! Apparently... It's like your dream come true. <laughs> god, I are you sure that. this isn't like Scott Crawford's movie? No, I would probably be the friend that I, I would be the friend in this movie that's dressed in cardboard armor, LARPing. Yeah, is not the last Scott Crawford <laughs> relic <Yeah>. of. <laughs> Relic of Gremlins. That's too funny. I mean, we're not taking ourselves seriously. Scott, you need to be more serious, okay? Oh, oh, sorry, serious face. <laughs> but uh, no, I. this is a horror comedy, and once again, another one that I was laughing my ass off. I'd had a couple recognizable faces from, like, sitcoms and other shows that I've seen. But yeah, they're just these slacker guys that the apocalypse is coming, and one of them finds out he's the son of Lovecraft, and, or not son, but uh, ancestor of Lovecraft, and he is the only savior of the world, and he didn't know if he had this relic that uh, these guys are after to summon Cthulhu and bring Cthulhu back to the world, and so, and it's just these really silly shenanigans, they go and meet this guy that is a total Lovecraft nerd, so me, once again, and he's oh. like a total nerd that's like, all about LARPing and like, oh, I've prepared for this. And he, it's like, but before we go out and do this, we need to, uh, we need to go practice and like, 
prepare for our for battle and they're literally beating each other with foam swords and the they're guy's like, really getting fireball good. fireball <laughs> i wouldn't have been surprised if he said that that type of character but oh my gosh it was just so silly and stupid and hilarious and just had like a lot of knowledge about lovecraft so like you could tell these guys are fans of like his material because of the creatures they bring up and mention and stuff but yeah i I think it's one of those where you would actually enjoy it because i wouldn't call it a actual lovecraft film in that way i don't know it just got like that as the storyline but like it's not like a deep like horror film like that um we'll see yeah we probably won't because you probably never will (laughs) i'm probably never gonna watch it you know that i'm like "Mm." (laughs) uh, i suggest movies in life I'll say, I, I suggest movies to Heather, and she'll go, hmm, that's nice, yes, I'll watch those, and I know it's not going to happen. Yeah, I do watch <laughs> some that you suggest. It's yeah, I do, yeah, you do. <laughs> but other ones, I'm like, that sounds like something that, I eventually watched The Void, and you know, also it happened there, so. Right. Um, you know, and which is, yet again, a good film, just not, just not my jam. Anyway, let's. And I, I got, got one, one more. more. Right, yeah. Um, so this one, <laughs> oh boy. America the movie in so many ways. Um, Team America, fuck yeah. <laughs> coming again to save the motherfucking day, yeah. yeah. Uh, but this one, uh, it felt, it's the, uh, we went with theme for, you know, our zombie films. So I watched this one and it was Uncle Sam from 1996. I've seen the VHS cover for this one for like ever since I was a little kid and I had no idea what it was about and realized, oh, it's about a zombie war veteran who dresses in an, uh, dresses in an Uncle Sam outfit. And <laughs> it happens during a, like, way over the top 4th of July what? celebration. <laughs> during the 4th of July? <laughs> wow. So, you, so unique. <laughs> right? So it is like, it's like America spewed up all over this oh, film. Oh, man, it sounds like such an original film. Oh, it, is, it so is. But it's, <laughs> here's where it gets really American because Uncle Sam because the character's name is actually Sam and the kid, the main character is a little kid and it's his uncle. So of course, Uncle Sam. Um, but he ends up dying from, a, uh, from I think, friendly fire or something like that. And, the, and then these punk kids end up burning an American flag that was draped over his uh, coffin. And, you know, it's a disgrace being an American <laughs> if you see your American flag getting stomped on or burnt. So the veteran comes back to life to enact revenge on everybody. And it is done by the director of Maniac, William Lustig, which is a completely different style for him. But this was very cheesy, but at the same time, I would recommend it if you're in for just uh, turn your brain off and watch. I thought it was going to be more a horror comedy, and it actually took itself seriously, which made it even funnier to me. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I don't think I'm gonna, I don't know. Maybe I will. <laughs> it's probably more likely than the Lovecraft stuff. Um, yeah, th- but I would recommend just like giving it a watch. It's just entertaining and just a uh, silly zombie movie. Oh boy. Oh man, these gems. <laughs> right. <laughs> this, <checked> <laughs> wow. this is the stuff that happens when we do our first time watches only challenge. You find some of these special <laughs> gems. Yep. 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 I also watched Bats from 1999, but I didn't really feel the need to talk about that. It's about some of because we talked about it on our creature episode, but I hadn't seen the movie. And oh, that's I finally right. watched the movie, and it was like so 99 like special effects. It wasn't bad though. You know, I enjoy those little silly creature features. I really do. Like, oh, so I do I. Expectations of them, but um, yeah, the rest of the time it's just been zombie party. Like, I feel like when we agreed to do zombies as this episode, I was, like, double down on them zombie movies. And, like, <laughs> I just, yeah, like, I think, I think you were, out of them. Yeah, I was say, I think you were more in on watching themed movies this time than you ever have been. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Like, so I'm, like, motherfucking zombie, son of a bitch I'm in. For anyone that <laughs> watches Rick, Rick and Morty, that's from that show. Yep, son of a bitch I'm in. <laughs> Fuck, that's such a good show. Um, anyway. I'm like no, it's not. It's not it. funny. No, just kidding. I'm oh, kidding. I was gonna say you probably don't find it funny. You're like, actually, I don't really no. like Rick and Morty. I don't find it funny. Yeah. I, I, no, I'm I actually. I'm Scott Crawford, and I have no sense of humor. <laughs> I actually find that show hilarious. A bit overrated to some people, but I still love it. Overrated, like you think people think it's better than it actually is. Oh uh, yeah, because I well, some people, not like you, because you don't talk about it all the time. But there's well, people no. that there's people that just won't shut up about it that I'm friends with, and I'm like. All right, guys. Would it be like if someone talked about Gremlins a lot? No. 
<laughs> not at all. Or what's that other one you love? It's always sunny in Philadelphia. Is it like that? <laughs> no, because I, I only bring that up every once in a while. <laughs> These like they almost just like they find a way to bring it into every conversation I have. So, so they'll be like, so anyway, I was going to the store. Did you know when Rick and Morty? <laughs> Exactly. I've seen some Pickle Ricks, man. Oh, my God. Oh, Pickle Ricks. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> we should do a Rick and Morty. The one where um, Scary Terry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we should bring that into some stuff. Oh, man. Anyway. All right. Uh, we should get into our podcast. So what we've been listening to. Um, yes. I'm just going to enter into this. So as we know, Venom, uh, the king of podcasts, has joined one of the queens, has joined one of the queen of podcasts. So Rebecca mm-hmm. Reinhardt has been running in the mic of madness for quite a while now. She's up in the 30th, 30 episode range. And she also works with Brad Thornton, who I don't really know. Do you know Brad? Uh, no. Um, no. Is he the one that they that recently quit the show? Or no, he's on he... there still. Okay. Yeah, Jason left, um, and so Venom has replaced Jason, um, and they are doing a Friday 13th, or they've done a Friday 13th retrospective, and let me tell you, Scott, you are a Friday 13th fan. Rebecca knows her shit. Like, oh, I believe it. She knows stuff about Friday the 13th that I was listening to this podcast, and I was like, damn, girl. <laughs> like, where did you learn that? Um, she's also an indie actress, and she very knowledgeable on the indie scene and i feel like she has like a lot to offer from that side of the coin as well and she ties that into the podcast but if you are looking to learn about friday the 13th and go into great you know retrospective of about the movies because one of the things that i find is so cliche is that people will always cover Friday the 13th movies. So they'll, they'll cover the big franchises. And I, what I appreciated for this show is Rebecca went into a deeper level to talk about, um, you know, the exact cities where things were filmed and where Annie was exactly when she was walking, where she was picked up by Mrs. Voorhees. And she even went to talk about the, the motorcycle that was used by Ralph and how it's still uh, in that city. Oh, wow. And yeah, still, or that town or whatever you want to call it, right? So really great podcast it's an independent independent podcast you can find her on facebook um and also i can't remember the server that it's on or the or where she finds it i i downloaded it through pod addict for myself but i'll include the links to scott and i would really recommend checking it out it's another lady horror fan so i'm always supporter supporter of my my women in horror and she knows her jam man and venom is great we all know and love venom from many many shows and i enjoy brad as well i think brad's great on there as well who's this guy venom you keep talking about like oh he's some dude he's some dude he only does like you know 40 he's the anti spider-man oh yeah that that yes okay (laughs) now you know i love you venom (laughs) uh so yeah i guess we'll uh jump into the podcast i decided to go with which we should both feel kind of ashamed on this one, Heather. Oh, I feel ashamed already. Um, this the show is on Legion, and I had no idea. And uh, uh, but it is Desmond's flicks. We actually uh, recently met Desmond uh, through doing one of our trivia nights, like about a month ago or so. And he was such a nice person, and I like I had heard of him, and I've known like through the podcasting community, and like such a great person to talk to. So I finally decided to look up his uh, podcast once I realized what the name of it was. And when I heard it was on Legion, I just kind of bowed my head in shame, but he (laughs) uh, ends up covering horror films, obviously, but he'll uh, have different guests on that. You will know through the podcasting community, like court Syops. He's had Paul Stevenson on. He's had Darren. Paul Stevenson. (laughs) Miss him. So do I, I I miss his show and it's, Mm -hmm. I don't see him on Facebook. Well, he's back on Facebook more now, which is awesome to see. Yeah. Doing his action figure stuff. And with his dog. Yes. He does a dog. lot of running, right? Yes, he does. And it makes me, I, I feel exhausted watching him. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then, yeah, he's, al- he's also had, uh, so yes, and he's also had uh, Darren from the Psycho Semantic podcast on here, which, uh, which is also another great show uh, and also another uh, fellow Legionnaire. But yeah, Desmond actually just recently released uh, episode 49. So he's been doing this for a little while. Uh, it looks like he's a bi-weekly show. And he just did an interview with the directors of Becky and Cooties, which I listened to today, which was really awesome. He's a fantastic interviewer. And I learned a lot about like the more behind the scenes stuff about that film. 
uh, from the directors, which the directors were also very just really cool people to listen to and talk, uh, hear the conversation back and forth. Yeah, I highly recommend this show because he does interviews, he does reviews. Like he did a uh, Christmas episode with Court Syop where they did a Christmas horror story, and I forget the other one, but they did reviewed two different films together, and like that, that was a really fun episode to listen to. And yeah, I highly recommend the show. Very, he's very well knowledge in the horror genre. And he's just got, like, this great, easy-to-listen-to voice. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. We'll definitely check him out. Yep, Love you, I, Desmond. Yep. Desmond, you're my boy. I, I hope to one day work with you. Uh, but, yeah. Um, so that is the end of our what we've been listening, what we've been watching and what we've been listening to. And we will uh, take a quick break and uh, promote another show. Uh, but uh, when we come back, we will be talking about zombies, the reality, and fantasy. And we're going to sing the song from Cranberries. Yes. Zombie, zombie, <laughs> zombie. Hey, 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 hey. This will keep it quiet. <laughs> oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You caught me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. <laughs> I said quiet. <laughs> My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. And welcome back. Uh, We are going to jump into our main topic of our show today, which is zombies, the reality, and fantasy. Uh, So the first thing I wanted to bring up on this is the definition of the word zombie. A zombie, which is Haitian French, also zombie, as Z-O-M-B-I, Haitian Creole, or zombie. It is a fictional undead corporeal revenant created through the reanimation of a corpse. Zombies are most commonly found in horror and fantasy genre works. The term comes from Haitian folklore in which a zombie is a dead body reanimated through various methods, most commonly magic. Modern depictions of the reanimation of the dead do not necessarily involve magic, but often invoke science fictional methods such as carriers, radiation, mental disease, vectors, pathogens, parasites, scientific accidents, etc. Uh, the English word zombie was first recorded in 1819 in the history of Brazil by the poet Robert Southey in the form of zombie, Z-O-M-B-I. The Oxford English Dictionary gives the word's origin as West African and compares it to the Congo words Mzambi, which is God, and Zumbi, which is fetish. A Kimbundu to Portuguese dictionary from 1903 defines the related word Zumbi as soul, while at later Kimbundu Portuguese dictionary defines it as being a spirit that is supposed to wander the earth to torment the living. Also known as Scott Crawford. No, that's to torment the Heather. <laughs> I like it. So yeah, um, zombies are such a popular gen- subgenre, and I think Scott, you were the one that said that you were tired of this subgenre. Yeah, I uh, I go through phases with this genre, like because it, especially like right after the popularity of Walking Dead hit, it just mm. was zombie after zombie after zombie movie, and like anybody can pretty much make a zombie film. Like that's, that's like that's like the go-to low-budget thing to do, and some of them can be really good, and then some others can just be really terrible. Yeah, I would agree with that, and we'll get into the fact that anybody can make one as we go <laughs> through our movies. I I don't really I find that this is a an area that is very easy to watch. It is. 
um, generally speaking, though I did challenge myself to watch, I would say, some more advanced zombie films that look at more social context um, and some more emotional issues. You know, though you can argue that Night of the Living Dead was about, even though it wasn't intended to be, it became very much a a reflection of society too, right? So oh, definitely, definitely did. Right. So I think that it's it's really an interesting subgenre, and it's part of our survival sub uh, survival episodes that we've been looking at. So last week we talked, or last week I would say last week, like we recorded last week, last time we talked about survival in specific areas, and now we're looking at survival in zombie films. So you know. How do you survive a zombie film? How do how are zombies reflected? Where do they come from? And and Scott and I will be doing some back and forth conversations on it. So, but let's start with why we got fascinated. So it before The Walking Dead, before any of that, um, there's an article where a Stanford scholar explains why zombie fascination is very much alive. And you can find this through the Journal of the Humanities at Stanford. And we have a link in our podcast to it and why zombies so modern obsession with zombies to the survivalist mentality developed after the second world war the fascination with the end of the world can be traced to the events of nuclear warfare or the i i want to say the looming nuclear warfare because there was really no nuclear war done back on the united states right. uh, the united states was really the aggressor in that situation and of course we could go into debates as to why they chose to do that and we will not do that on this podcast though i could because (laughs) i did take american history when i was in university and happened to know a lot on the subject but i digress um so basically if we look at the horrific events of hiroshima and namasaki which i think you're probably familiar with scott just a little bit yeah like what happened to those people is unspeakable (laughs) <laughs> oh it's horrible and the effects that they are still feeling you know this yeah. wasn't a one-time thing so a decision that was made had a huge impact so the reality of this was that mass destruction became a reality and it and the terrible violence of the, the holocaust which you know if we look at that event as well it is the true horrors you know those are those those are two events when we look at nuclear bombs and holocaust of true horrors of society and the cruelty that the human race is, is capable of. And other, you know, other events brought up the disturbing realization that we have a very high level of violence in our, in our society. Now we could go back to the Roman days where gladiators would fight each other and for entertainment that occurred as well too. But I think if we look at in recent years, within, you know, the last 200 years, these are some events that really stand out. So events within the 20th century, along with the movement to increase environmental awareness, has caused a lot of doubt about the consequences of our development as a modernized society. Instead, we are left with this cultural fixation on our own death and very specifically mass-scale destruction. So we tend to be very obsessed with the idea of mass-scale destruction, which I feel like COVID has kind of fostered to a little bit just yeah you can right? definitely say that right now we don't have covid zombies walking around but there's definitely a fear level that reminds me of sometimes of a, of a zombie film not that it's not ungranted covid is a very dangerous thing and i'm not at all downplaying it but i just find their similarities oh very so, very similar right so using a fictional narrative a fictional narrative not only to emotionally cope with the possibility of impending doom but even more importantly perhaps to work through the ethical and physiological frameworks that in many ways are left shattered in the wake of world war ii so basically world war ii changed this this world it changed you know when we look at world wars and we look at world war one and we look at the cause of world war one and we look at the cause of world war ii it was two very different causes for both of those wars and the second world war changed the face of every country i would say across this planet and it really did create that fear of overall violence it it really pulled onto our ethics and what we um believed was right or wrong and to this day i think there's a lot of debating about what occurred from that war and the aftermath of it of what was right and wrong was there yeah. decisions that were made right so very very historically based and we create zombies and this world ending fear to kind of help us deal with it yeah that right? makes a lot of sense and we use fiction all the time to help us deal with 
issues, right? Horror movies and stuff like that are that safe way of being scared. Like we talked about last week with the survival films, when we see people getting lost in the desert or in the forest and they're trying to fight to survive, we can put ourselves in their situation without actually putting ourselves in their situation. And that provides an escape. It provides a fantasy of some kind. And I think zombie films is what we're arguing does the exact same thing. Oh, it definitely does. And right. like, I think there was a thing that I read a long time ago, but like uh, people are afraid of zombies for the fact that zombies represent our animalistic natures. Absolutely. And it ties into being able to survive. And it's not only the survival of ourselves that we're concerned about, it's the survival of the human race in, in general, right? Yeah. And where will we go and how will we foster from here? So it's interesting because it kind of, you know, these movies float back and forth between very individualistic concerns to, to group concerns, which is always fascinating when you look at psychologists and sociologists because psychologists will always argue for the individual's preference and what they view and sociologists will talk about the needs of the group so i think that it's a very interesting concept that zombies pull on you know and that's a very deep look into the zombie genre but if we look at where it's got popularity from the original night of the living dead came out in the 60s which is just you know not that far off of the completion of world war ii and that generation growing up with the fear and the understanding of what the end of world war ii meant right yeah. so very, very fascinating. So zombies are an important reflection of ourselves. Um, the ethical decisions that the survivors have to make under duress and the actions that follow those choices are very unlikely. Are there unlikely anything that would have done in the normal state of life? 100%. Yep. And I think we saw a, a, a smidgen of that when there was suddenly an announcement, and I can only speak to Canada and the United States, where, where, we, where, where we were restricted our movement, right? So COVID-19 did restrict our movement. We could no longer go to restaurants. We could no longer go to the movie theater. We could no longer go to the gym. We were limited to the groups of people that we were supposed to be in. Now, enforcement was done, at least in Canada, through bylaw. So, you know, much like if you park your car in a place that you shouldn't park, you get a bylaw ticket. So if bylaw saw you in a group of like 10 people out at a park going on the playground, you were going to get a ticket. It's not like you were going to be beaten because you were <laughs> right. Right. So, you know, even with that small sample, we had people acting very individualistic. Some of them like hoarding items out of fear that for some reason, supply chains would be cut off, that it was going to be like a zombie apocalypse and everyone was going to get so sick with this virus that there was going to be no ability to bring in food or supplies. You know, if we really look at like the base level of what was happening there, that's what it was happening. There was a fear of, I will not be able to access things, which is such a first world thing. Oh, it is. It really, like, really is. You know, you know, we, we are so lucky that we can go to the grocery store, we can go to Walmart, we can go to wherever and have access to whatever we need. You know, there are people that live in various countries. You know, we look at the continent of Africa. And if we were to dissect each of those countries, we would see poverty that we can't even imagine, you know, yeah. as Americans and Canadians, right? Just for an example. And I'm just using that continent and specific countries in there as an example. So I think that's really interesting that we're seeing a sample of this. And then you had the people that were concerned for others, that were, you know, setting up foundations for food banks and yeah. trying to find ways that people could donate or, or support seniors that couldn't get out. So yeah, and you, you had, had people that split it. Yeah, and you had pe like neighbors coming and checking on other neighbors just to make yeah. sure they're okay. And the, if they needed supplies, they'd go get them for them. Like, yeah, at least like this is exactly how the human race would react in a zombie apocalypse. Like you would have like the individuals that are all about themselves and trying mm -hmm. to like just provide for themselves and their family. And you have the others that are willing to risk themselves and getting sick to help others and to make sure others are safe. It is so a zombie movie without the actual zombie. And it's interesting. And, and you know, we're not a political podcast, so I'm going to dance a little bit into this area and, and not go fully in how structures of healthcare systems really reflect that. You know, it, Canada, we have a socialistic healthcare system. You get sick. There was protection that was laid out for you very clearly that you would not lose your job. There was money that you could access. You don't have to pay anything to go to the doctor. Um, you know, there isn't a vaccine. So it's just basically taking time off or you're admitted into the hospital and that's not of cost. You can go on a ventilator here in Canada and you're not going to be out of pocket. Like yeah. it's not a thing, right? It's very different in the United States. Yeah, because here we got the free testing, but 
if you're wanting to be cured of it or like just being taken care of at the hospital, um, there was someone, I didn't really look into the details of what exactly was entailed, but someone got a million dollar hospital bill for being cured of COVID. And, you know, I think if we look at, you know, and I don't want to become too political here, but I think it's important with, you know, your election coming up this year that people look at the bigger picture and yeah. to understand that to, to, it would be like just us testing to see if someone's a zombie or not, and then letting them go free. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> I mean, uh, and we, we were talking about this, like just in our personal conversations before, but like how Americans are, are, are afraid to call in sick because some places don't get sick days and are taken care of so they will end up coming into work with the illness or sickness and like we actually had like rules here in the U.S. like once COVID hit like big time we're like all right every company in the world was going all right if you are feeling sick do not come in like the companies were actually like paying out of pocket to keep people home during this which is good to see but I mean, before all this, like, yeah, someone could have had the flu and they couldn't afford to call in and their bosses wouldn't let them have the day off. So they'd come into work and infect everybody else. And I would say Canada has the same, okay? Like, I don't want to put Canada as this golden, you know, like if you're working at Starbucks and you can't, and you're sick, you're not being paid that day, right? Like that's reality. But I think the difference is, is you're not out of pocket to go in and get treatment at the hospital. Right. Like, and we do have programs for children to get medicine. And if you go to the doctor and you don't have benefits, which A, it doesn't cost you anything to go to the doctor. If you're going to the doctor for free, that doesn't cost you anything. So if you can't get benefits, they'll find a way. You know, there's a way that they try to make sure people can get medicine. It, it doesn't work out all the time, but there is a way, right? If you yeah. go to the ER and you need treatment, they will give you treatment. This, it doesn't matter if you if you if you are a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident and you have a health card in the province of Ontario, you are going to get treatment. And I think that you know before yeah, we're getting I know we're getting really political here, but if we look at the zombie outbreak thing and we look at how people reacted here, I think it's really important that we look at you know we always think of fantasize on how we would be, and that's why The Walking Dead is so popular and it's and it's safe like it's a safe fantasy. COVID wasn't a safe fantasy. COVID no. happened right and even though it's not a zombie apocalypse and you know yes people have passed away unfortunately and um it's a very sad situation because of that but i think it really makes us reflect on our own behaviors and it yeah, makes it us does. reflect on what is important and and what can be done to better structure you know society in general right to prevent um illnesses from happening again and these films though while going through covid provided a great escape for it that's why they came up with corona zombies right like it that's an escape that's a way to kind of like deal with the process of having our society completely changed around us so let's make a cheesy zombie movie well let's it was already a movie and let's slap corona zombies on it and it gives people something to escape to right, right. so horror does do that as well as well as try to educate and make us think outside the box yeah it absolutely does right so anyway so i also looked at another article uh so this was in Live Science, Nine Reasons Why We Have under Undying Interest in the Undead. So I'll read them backwards, I think. So I'll start off at number nine and, work it, and make it work backwards. So zombie stories make us feel hopeful, right? There usually is a group of people that survive, in not all cases, but they survive. And in some movies, the human race has been able to overcome. It gives us that kind of hope that anything is possible. Yep. Right. Um, number eight, it's a scary situation that we think we could handle. Yeah, I can see that. Like, though, like the reality of what's going on, gone on in the world shows that maybe some of us can't. <laughs> yeah, I think that, you know, it's it's really taught us that when you have the herd mentality of panic um people react in different ways like i think if we you know we'll get into zombie movies more but if you look at some of the opening scenes of train to Busan and the yeah. panic you know i think that's absolutely 100 percent what would happen oh absolutely <laughs> you know? and like right. kind of the same thing with uh the dawn of the dead remake with the opening of that like yes the panic absolutely right so you know i i think that now there's some people that, that are very resourceful and certain things occur where you go yes i would do the same thing or yes we could be able to handle this i i think it does provide some hope there as well but it also opens up our eyes to how humans actually behave yeah number six we like fear well that's why we're horror fans yeah. um we like that adrenaline rush, rush of being afraid but in a safe atmosphere 
Number five, we're attracted to violence. We've already talked about that. Um, there's an animalistic side of all humans, which is part of it includes violence, which is why we enjoy it. Uh, number four, we are intrigued by the art of survival. And I think that's where the whole survival horror comes in. You know, that's why yeah. we have all these survival movies that we talked about last time of people getting lost in the woods, stuck in the ocean, in the desert, in the cold, whatever. And people surviving it gives us inspiration, right? We, we get, because we can picture ourselves yet again, safely in that situation. And yep. that gives us a sense of fantasy and escape. Yep. And once again, uh, survivalists would be the type of people you would want in this situation. So like Kenneth. Yes. Like Kenneth yes. would be like the survival specialist that we would want to be around because he would know how to like survive during all of this. Not Scott and I. Next no. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, uh, we're not going to give tips on how, to, well, I mean, we kind of will later. We but. will. But uh, if you want to take them seriously, you can. If you right. think that this is like. You know, this isn't Zombieland 3 here, okay, guys? Like, <laughs> don't keep your expectations low. I ain't no Jesse Eisenberg. And you are definitely no Woody Harrelson. Oh, so... oh come on. I was just going to say, I'm totally, I'm totally Harrelson. No. No, Scott. No. You're, I'm always no, you're not for... even Asylum Harrelson, okay? I, I'm always looking for Twinkies. Come on. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, so zombies, so number three, zombies respect a need to connect with um, – a need to humanity respect a need to con connect with humanity hmm, that's interesting how they wrote it but anyway so yeah like i think zombies take us back to that basic human nature and even in some i think it's land of the dead where the zombies start to unify yeah i always like that one even though that movie's kind of like the remake's kind of eh, <laughs> it's not that good i like how they unify i think that's really cool yeah like and it's a growing and it's a continuous thing throughout romero's films especially like dawn to day to land because you see them zombies learning and kind of getting back their human nature again and i think land of the dead was like the culmination of that where they've learned to work as a team in groups and learn how to use tools which is really it's a cool concept right it's looking back to basic human development which is really funky yeah. um too so zombies are more thrilling than they are terrifying yeah absolutely i think yeah. the thought of like zombie shit just it makes people love it like zombie costumes zombie runs like there's so many examples of where people just love zombies they just think it's the coolest shit ever and probably for all the reasons we talked about safe escape is a situation that we think we can handle and maintain and it's a fantasy yeah and zombies i probably would say are the most popular of the horror genre I think and are also in the mainstream too. I yeah. think that people are more likely to recognize what a zombie is and think it's cool. Yeah, exactly. Now, when I say zombies, though, I think they think of the slow moving ones, not the crazy mofos from Dawn of the Dead remake. Yeah, or the or uh, twenty eight days later. Or twenty eight days later, the rage virus and stuff. It's rage virus, I think it's yep. called. Um, but yeah, and then finally, we enjoy the concept of the end of the world. We like thinking that there's going to be an apocalypse and that there's going to be no turning back. And this is it. And hell, that is once again something that we're kind of living through right now. Everyone's like, oh, 2020 is the end of the world because of everything that's happened. And like, what's happened? Yeah, okay, there was just, a virus and you weren't allowed to go to the movie theater. Right. But yep, people are <gasps> calling it like the end of the world. It's like, nope, just, just a rough year. Well, and it's not even that rough of a year. Like, let's be real talk here, Scott. So oh, yeah. I could only order takeout. And I could just go to the grocery store, but I had Netflix. I had the right to video chat with whoever I wanted. Basically, our governments just said, look, we don't want this virus spreading anymore because we don't want our healthcare system to be over capacity, which is what it was about, people. That's what yeah. it's about. And we all were like, oh, my God, we need all the toilet paper. Right? <laughs> like, I just, I find when people say how bad it is. We don't know what bad is, okay? We didn't live through the Holocaust. We don't know what bad is. Right. We weren't in, you know, Hiroshima or Nagasaki when it got bombed. We don't know how bad it is. I, I think there's one thing to be like, man, this is depressing, which we've all had our days where we feel crummy. But this is nowhere close to the end of the world. No. Right? It is, it is first world problems. And <laughs> we should be thankful we're not in a country like India where they have such a high population base that it's very difficult to control the amount of people that are getting sick and passing away very violently and painfully from this. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, and the murder hornets and I don't know what was else and, and, you know, some political movements, which 
are all issues that have been around for over 200 years. So <laughs> again, none of this is new. It's just great that it's finally coming to the limelight and I hope people follow through with the commitment on it and, and stick with it. So I think that you're right. People think that this is like the end of the world, but it's such the furthest thing. Like I'd be much more scared if Dawn of the Dead was to actually happen. Right. Like that to me is is way scarier than I can only drive through McDonald's to get my right. Car. Like you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Anyway, um, look at me. I'm so like we're all go goofy, and now I'm all like angry political Heather hat. <laughs> we can we switch back and forth on this show. We do. We're just all over the place. So yeah. Um, so anyway, we're going to have a general discussion, Scott and I, about different zombie movies, and we've broken them into two different categories. So zombie, just like horror, gives us the safe fantasies, hereby engaging in which, um, hereby engaging in violence, which sometimes has a sad ending. Dead S Snow 2009 is an example of that. The Crazies 2010. The short story in VHS 2, A Ride in the Park, which I think you've seen all these that I'm listing off, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Night of the Living Dead, 1968, which is actually the saddest ending. The original. Yeah, that is such a just <sighs> gut punch of an ending. And I, I've seen the 1990 remake, and we'll get into that. I didn't like that one as much. I did enjoy the fact that the main girl, oh my goodness, I can't remember her name. Barbara. Barbara wasn't as annoying. No, Barbara was actually a badass. Like yeah, like movie. Barbara kind of like kicked ass and took names, but that was the only part I really liked about it. No, I love that movie, but uh, like it doesn't have the political message behind it, like uh, Night of the Living Dead '68 which accidentally wasn't came across. Yeah, yeah was which like, wasn't intended, but man, was it? They were just like he was the best for the role. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, which is and, really pretty progressive. Yeah, it's very progressive, especially for that time. Sense, right. So, um, anyway, and then Pet Cemetery, the nineteen ninety or two thousand and nineteen uh, story. Neither one of those have happy endings. No, especially the original is just such a film full of dread with yeah. the atmosphere, and it's like I feel like just depressed when I watch that movie. I love that movie, but to this day, like the dread of that film and the suffering of loss and everything through it is just like so just devastating you got to be in like the right mental state to watch that film the only thing that's good about that movie is it's kind of cheesy uh so yeah. you don't get as tied into it where the 2019 one you know i don't i don't shit all over that movie i thought it was it was okay, okay. um they gave too much away in the trailer which was a yeah. huge mistake and you know maybe we'll get into spoilers more later about it i just thought the ending was so stupid yeah, like, the ending was very ridiculous. I remember laughing in the movie theater. I was like, what the hell? Yeah, I was I was on a date that day, and me and my oh. date just kind of looked at each other, looked back at the screen, looked at each other, and went, let's get out of here. <laughs> like, it was just so, like, anyway, whatever. Actually, that was the night I did my first podcast ever. I came oh, home was it? and I recorded, yeah, I recorded with the guys from Kill the Cast. With oh, nice. Kenneth and Jay, yeah. You know, it was my first time. Um, uh, you always remember your first. You always remember, well, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, stories that are based on heroes with sacrifice. So these are the ones where, you know, we get that great sacrifice. And Trained Persaun, oh my God, there's one sacrifice in this movie that oh. one of the main characters make where you're just like... <laughs> a monster to not feel for that dude yeah i i was bawling like a baby right. throughout this movie oh my god and it's so the characters in this are just uh we'll get into train to piss on later because it's such a such a solid movie um i put night of the living dead 1990 because we kind of already alluded that there is a hero that comes out of that one and yep. there is some sacrifice that occurs 28 days later i'm not sure if you remember um the father i vaguely do yeah there's a scene so spoiler uh where the father gets blood in his eye and he's about to okay that him. was yep that's yeah. the scene i remember right um so that is a very you know emotional and then cargo 2017 is another movie of sacrifice where there is a survivor but uh many people are sacrificed in order to make it through so yeah. You know, there's there's definitely two types of zombie movies, and I refer to them as the double S's, the serious and the silly. Okay, so you're either finding a zombie movie that has a serious tone to it, or you're finding a zombie movie that is silly. Now, silly ones may still have some political stuff in there, but generally speaking, they tend to be um, a little bit more funny. 
So we're going to look at the three different subcategories that we've broken into where zombies come from. So we're going to start off with the first one, which is rise from the grave. And we're going to talk about the night of the living dead original. So moving forward, these movies will have spoilers. Uh, so every movie that we bring up, Scott will put a footnote for the movies. It's pretty easy because I've kind of listed them all here. So he just has to copy and paste them, but we will be sharing what happens in these films. So if you have not seen these films and you're concerned about spoilers, there will be some spoilers. So let's start with the original Night of the Living Dead. Scott, I know you are a huge fan. Yes, I am a huge fan of Romero's, especially the Dead trilogy and even some of his later films, minus Survival of the Dead. <laughs> so tell me what you like about these movies if you want to do it the original series first what did you think was done well um you know what kind of ties into our fascination with zombies like just your thoughts in general well one thing i love about george romero's i'll go with the original trilogy first mm -hmm. is that he makes the zombies the backdrop it is very character focused and Obviously, that has inspired over the years many, many other films to kind of copy that formula where it is all about human survival and humans working uh, forced in a situation where they got to work together. And usually that ends up not being a good situation. Mm. And especially with Night of the Living Dead with, you know, Barbara, Ben, I uh, forget the guy, the guy and his wife that are in the basement with their sick I believe daughter. one of them's name is George. George, yeah. Um like, especially in that situation in the first one, because there's a lot of racial tensions, mistrust from George, who's, and, like, ways to survive in a uh, isolated Oh, sorry, farmhouse. no, it's Harry. It's Harry. Harry, thank you. Helen and Karen. Okay, yep. And, but yeah, this one is, like, you know, they shows the tension between, like, the two different groups of survivors in this house on how to hold off on the zombie, zombie apocalypse. Do we lock ourselves in the basement and just uh, hide out the entire time? Or do we stay upstairs, just barricade everything, and just, you know, fight off the hordes as they're coming up to the door? Like, that's always a question that will be brought up in, like, a lot of, like, a lot of zombie films. And, you know, pretty much George Romero is the grandfather of the horror genre, or the zombie genre. And I think the scene that really sticks out to me, and it's so famous, is that opening gra uh, graveyard scene with Johnny and Barbara. And he's, I, I can't remember why they're there. I think they're, they're going to visit, I think it was their mother. Their mother's grave, right? Yeah. And it would have been interesting if, I think, does her mother come back as a zombie? Uh, no, I don't believe she does. Probably, she probably decomposed too much. She's probably yeah. old and probably was decomposed. But I really enjoy that scene where they start coming out of the ground. Because I go for walks every day and I walk by this cemetery and I'm always like, one day I'm going to walk by and today will be the day that the zombies rise. And I think that scene was just so smart. Like it was so smart because I don't know how many graveyards you've been to. I'm, unfortunately, I've also had a lot of death in my family. Insane. So I've, I've buried a lot of people, which death is a natural part of life. I actually don't have a problem talking about death. Um, I have a problem talking about suicide, but I don't have a problem talking about death. And I think that opening scene, man, was it impactful. Yeah. You know, yeah, they're was... coming to get you, Barbara. They're coming to get you. Like, it's just so creepy. Yeah, and it's such an iconic line, too, that I will always remember. And then even gets used in one of my favorite zombie comedies, Shaun of the Dead. Yes, which is an excellent comedy as well. And I, I never, like, so I have seen the remake to The Night of the Living Dead, which I felt was, like, just a vomitation of, no, of, of the 90s. Um, I it did, really was. You know, and I did enjoy that Barbara was a little more badass, but I honestly prefer the original. As, as much as Barbara annoys me and as much as it makes me upset that Ben is shot at the end, I, I still find that movie more realistic to what would happen. You know, the zombies would be moving stiffly. They, I, I would probably also barricade myself in the house. I would de definitely do my best to arm myself. I think Barbara acted like a typical her a hysterical individual that had just lost her brother and was in trauma. Yeah. Like this was like, as much as we all want to be like, oh man, I'd be so calm and cool and collective and totally down with it. I don't think people would honestly act like that. <laughs> like, I think maybe eventually you would get there once the shock wore off and you're like, all right, I need to deal with this situation. Right. But, but we no. say that also, sorry, we say that after now having a billion zombie movies out. Yeah. Right? 
Yeah, but you got to put yourselves in the character's situation and realize they don't know what a zombie is. They've never seen zombie movies. Cause, especially in 1968. Right, especially in 68. But like also, there would have been a little bit of zombie stuff. Isn't that a part of the Universal Monsters? Would there have been any stuff there? I don't I Not do really. No, and I was going to say, and the one thing that uh, the zombie genre tends to do a lot, there's only been a few movies, but a lot of the zombie genre tends to pretend that zombie movies have not been a thing yes and so people don't know anything about them or what they are where zombie comedies obviously yeah because they'll reference oh this is like night of the living dead and blah 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 but yes but like the more serious ones yeah they don't represent like people don't know what a zombie is they've never experienced it never seen it on screen so putting them in their shoe put yourself in their shoes in that situation you're gonna freak the hell out your brother's dead you're on your own you're like and you're with these complete and utter strangers in this house with what appears to be the dead coming back to life and like surrounding the house if i was her i would be freaking the hell out like in 1968 like yet we said like it would be like what the hell and and we're right on the cusp of you know nuclear warfare yeah right so excellent film for those who have not watched um the night of the living dead i i definitely think it's you know, I think as a horror fan, it's a, it's a must-see. I really do. And I prefer the black and white version myself. I know there's, I think there's a colorized version. Yeah, and it's, it's Yeah, I, I prefer the black and white. I think the black and white has that true originality to it and reflects the time. Yep, I actually have a Blu-ray double edition that I got that has the original and the 1990 remake on it oh, on cool. two different discs. And I recommend both because the uh, remake, is just more of a you get yourself a very strong female character that goes through the stress and emotions but she ends up coming around at the end and becoming a badass and then you have i mean you have tony todd so you can't complain there tony oh, todd yeah. does tony an excellent Todd's job awesome yeah and like but yeah the original is a lot more hard hitting and scary but like the remake is also a one to must see see i disagree with you on that i i don't care for the remake as much but that's okay um, and I find the fem- and I think it's too female. I I would have preferred the original. I I just think the right. remake made Barbara as much as she's less annoying, and I prefer that. Um, I just don't like it as much, except for Tony Todd being in it, to be honest. But that's yet again, check it out. Um, two very different opinions on the remake, which is good. Sometimes Scott and I always see things eye to eye, but it's nice when we disagree. Right. Um, so the next one in the series that I you know, that I have really any knowledge on it, if you want to talk about the other ones, absolutely, is Dawn of the Dead. So the original one is, I think, pretty famous. Like, yeah, from 1978, is... right? Um, and that was the direct sequel, I believe, to The Night of the Living Dead. Yep. Yeah. And, yeah. sorry, go ahead. I was saying, yeah, I think this is the around the time that, uh, I can't remember the name of the guy, but, like, the person that worked with George Romero on Night of the Living Dead, um, because if you notice the change of the title, Night of Living Dead to Dawn of the Dead, yes. the Living Dead part ended up going to uh, this other guy. I forget his name, but he ended up writing, uh, writing and working on Return of the Living Dead. And that's where the Living Dead part, he was allowed oh. to use the Living Dead part there when George and him separated and did their own thing. And they did their own thing. Okay, that makes sense. So this one is basically based in you know a mall, the majority of it. Yep. shopping center which a lot of people do go and visit um and it's pretty interesting on how they try to survive and it kind of shows the the motorcycle gang trying to loot and rob them all as well and a lot of characters are involved in it it's it's a little bit of a slower movie at times it's two and a half hours yeah it's a very slow burn zombie film right But I do like the concept of using the shopping center. And I know that was like uh, supposed to be a tie into consumerism at the time and how, you know, we'd become done to consumerism. But I found that the zombies were very realistic, but the makeup is so simplistic. They basically look like they just splashed some green paint on them and were like, you a zombie now. (laughs) Yeah, but this is like the first time you really get to see the true work of tom savini in his early days well and he was also in it as well as motorcycle rider that's his that's his (laughs) i love that that's his like uh that's his credit here on uh imdb but what do you think of this one i as a as a zombie george a romano fan um i would say like 
this is a very important film in the horror genre, let alone just the zombie genre. Um, it is well known, very popular. This is where like the true look of the zombie comes from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The societal commentary on this is just great and fantastic with the whole consumerism part because the dead are coming back to something that they were used to and at that time and what was popular were shopping centers well and it was like that zombie vision of just buying for the sake of buying right yeah. consuming for the sake of consuming and this has one of the greatest lines in horror movie history and that is when there's no more room in the hell the dead will walk the earth which is also used by the no more room in hell podcast Yep. Only they say the dead will start a podcast, which I think is super awesome. But yeah, I just, I, that is like one of my all time favorite quotes. Now, my personal opinion on this movie, I think it's a bit too slow. Mm. I, I respect it. I like the movie, uh, but it is definitely not my favorite of the trilogy. I do like the slow moving zombies on how they corner them in at various places in the mall. Like when, there's certain mistakes that are made that allows the zombies to follow them up the stairwell to get to the offices that they're hiding in yep. and where they're being closed in on. And at one point Peter locks himself in the room and he's going to kill himself. Um, well, Francine gets away and then he changes his mind and he runs out to the helicopter and you're not sure if he's going to make it. Like, right. honestly, like that scene was really well done. Cause I'm like, Oh my God, is this dude going to make it? Because these zombies aren't actually moving that quickly. No, that is the one thing about these zombies is they are slow and shambling, just like they would be if they were coming from the dead because the rigor mortis is kicked in, their joints aren't working, yep. their muscles aren't working nearly as much, they're atrophied. And, but yeah, like that's what makes them scary though is just that they are in large numbers and you can be outnumbered if you are not careful. Well, and you panic, right? Yeah. Because they're taking so long to get to you, you think you have more time than you actually do. Yeah, exactly. So you're almost triple guessing, double guessing, trying to do other things. It's like when you're trying to get ready to go somewhere and you think you have a lot of time and you start panicking, trying to do all these things and you think you can get it done in that time. And then you always fuck something up because yeah. <laughs> maybe that's me anyway, because you did, me. right? I, I feel like that's what this movie represented is that slow, slow immersion of the zombies. And I think that ending scene with Peter in that room and then coming in and him not sure if they're going to make it to the helicopter or not. Um, it's a really, really great scene. Yeah, and another thing that this movie is good at representing is, you know, they go to a place that is great for survival with all the, like, stores in there that they can raid. But the unfortunate thing is they get complacent and comfortable in their safety. Yes, and they, they do. Let, they do let their guard down a bit. Well, they make silly mistakes. Yeah. And right. they make those mistakes because they let their guard down and not worry about it. And that ends up being the undoing of some of the characters. Absolutely. No, you're 100% right. And then the remake is very different. Yeah. Right? To start off with, the zombies are super, super badass. Yeah, they are freaking fast. They all look like a bunch of people that did speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're all like, well, let's fuck shit up. And the opening scene always got to me and uh, i saw this i think in theaters so did um, i and i remember uh so the woman's a nurse sarah polly i believe it's a character but yep. i can't remember her name i'm just looking it up right now uh anna so anna returns home after a long night as a nurse and her and her husband are in bed and they wake up with a young lady who a, a little girl that's in their bedroom and her husband gets up to kind of be like, oh, sweetie, what's wrong? And, and she bites him and, like, falls to the wall. Yeah, that scene is terrifying. Right? And I would totally be the husband being bit because mm-hmm. I would approach a child. And I love that they used a child because I'd be like, oh, sweetheart, what's wrong? And, and sweetheart would fuck me up. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, that's how that shit would go down. And from there, she escapes out through the bathroom, and she's running. She flees to her in her car, and it crashes. She passes out. Like shit happens throughout this film, and it's just bang, 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 bang. So what? What would you say is the biggest thing that you pull from this compared to the original? It's just the uh, imminent danger of these zombies. Because yeah, while the other ones were slow and shambling, and like were in hordes as well you could eventually, like, you could outsmart them and outmaneuver them. 
these ones were smarter and faster, which means mm-hmm. you can't outrun them. You have to be like in close proximity of some type of safety at all times. You, if you're left out in the open, you're fucked. And it just made the, like in this movie, it just made the zombies much more of a immediate threat that needed to be taken care of. And I don't feel like this played on consumerism nearly as much. The mall is in it, no. but it is not a focus. They do a lot of stuff on the roof. <laughs> yeah, and they treat this right. more, like treat the mall more like a playground of like things and scenarios. Yeah, right. Um, I do like the speed of the zombies, but I don't know if that's realistic for people coming back from the dead. I, no, I don't it, know how quick people would be if they were actually risen from the dead. Like, I do feel like the original is a lot more truth to that. Well, that's the thing about the remake, too, that I'm not too sure of is, like, because the other ones were, you know, the dead are coming back. And this one, people are getting bit, dying, then automatically coming back. Yeah, like, it's like this. It's instant. Yeah, so it's like, it's not like the, like, they've been dead forever and are finally rising. Nope, these ones are, like, the freshly dead are coming back. Like, in the original, when Karen is bit, it takes a lot of time for her to come back. You know, and I think that that does play into more of the realism, but I think the 2004 one was modern day. So if we look at the running time of the 2004 one, let's see here, a um, hundred minutes. So that's just over, uh, what would that be? Yeah, an about hour an hour and 40, 40. Yeah. right? So we've shaved an hour off. Yeah. Right. So, you know, we're not getting as much character development. It's, it's pretty quick to the hit chase. And, and about this ending, I always thought the ending was interesting. So, um, Anna, Keith, Nicole, and Terry, and Chip flee on a yacht. Yep. A yacht. <laughs> and um, footage from a camcorder found on the boat shows the group running out of supplies, arrives at an island, and is attacked by a swarm of zombie, and the camcorder drops, leaving their fate unknown. What do you think happened to them? I think that they, that is where they met their untimely demise. And at some point, when you're in this world... I don't know about you, but I'd probably just be like, you know what? Fuck this shit. I can't beat him. Join yeah. him. I'm done ass. running. I'm <laughs> done. <laughs> well, and like, uh, what's his uh, name from uh, Land of the Dead? He goes, well, I want to see what the other side's like eventually. Well, and, and I feel like Land of the Dead's a little different because yeah. they have developed a, a community. Yeah. You know, like here though you're constantly on the run like a lot of the zombie movies we're going to talk about today a lot of people are constantly on the run and how long and what are you running for yeah because well like i brought up on our survival episode um you are constantly on the run and have to like think because you're getting tired find places to hide and rest because what's chasing you doesn't get tired doesn't need rest yeah doesn't need to stop it will continue to chase yeah, I just think it's a really interesting concept, and we'll get into that more. I don't know if you want to talk about any of the other ones. I haven't watched it. Like, I've only seen the remake, Land of the Dead. I haven't seen the other ones to give any commentary on yep. it. Well, I'll bring up Day of the Dead, because uh, that one brought up a different, like, this is where, like, the zombies start showing some motor functions that were not in the other films. So, like, mm-hmm. in Day of the Dead, you got you are following a group of scientists and military men that are oh i did see in the bunker the remake. it was painful painful bloodlines yeah don't watch yeah, that I had, to sh- I, I had to shut it off it was so bad i couldn't do it yeah the original day of the dead is what, my favorite of the trilogy like okay. it's i'll have to find the original it is a very good film um mainly because i'm a huge special effects lover and the special effects in this are insane and some of the character development but This just shows the stress of being forced to work alongside people that don't have the same beliefs as you and like the pressure of like being stuck in the situation for probably months to months to years. And, but yeah, this is where you see the development of a zombie that is remembering things and learning some of his old motor functions because he was an ex soldier. So he remembers how to salute. He remembers how to, uh, use a gun he Mm. like he he learns to communicate by like tapping at something that he wants and like a scientist is like trying to show him and teach him these things so i I thought so i thought that was really fascinating because that's when you see the progression into the land of the dead where zombies have learned how to use tools and have worked are learning to work together so it all builds on each other right yeah so um unfortunately because i haven't seen them i can't really comment more on that but it sounds like it's a good development of um getting kind of bringing back the humanization of it right yeah 
Um, the next one I want to bring up, and I don't want to talk about it much. I only watched it because your old podcast was named after this. And yeah, anyway, it was called The House by the Cemetery, uh, 1981, which Scott's podcast is called the podcast, the former podcast was called the podcast by the cemetery. So I just assumed it was a really good movie and it's not a bad movie for everyone out there. That's going to like freak out at me because I didn't love this movie. The ending was great. The zombie at the end was great. Um, but leading up to it, it wasn't even a real zombie film. So no, it really <laughs> I had wasn't. it in here. And anyway, but the zombie technically is someone that was dead and comes back. I don't know if you want to add anything to the house by the cemetery. No, nah, there's not really much. It's that more of a haunted be. house film. Yeah, that's right. pretty much like a haunted house slasher film is how I look at it. But it is definitely based on coming back from the dead zombies. So let's move right along to Pet Cemetery. Yep. Um, we talked about it already uh, loosely. I think the biggest, I, I did enjoy that they switched to Ellie being the person or the individual that comes back from the dead. That scene where uh, the father saves Gage in the remake and then Ellie gets hit is sad. Um, it is and you know it's coming you know it's gonna happen but it's still sad um and i and i think her zombie look is pretty cool uh yeah i just uh the only thing i didn't like about her in the remake was the fact that she was like the exposition machine and gave like reasons why she's doing the things she's doing now where when gage was like the gage was smaller and wasn't able to speak more innocent yeah, more innocent, and yeah. it just made it more terrifying. Where with her, it I don't know, it took something away from it. Like it wasn't wasn't terrible, but it just took something away from me. You know, it didn't for me. I'll be honest. I didn't I didn't dislike her. As no, I didn't dislike the antagonist. her antagonist. I thought that what I didn't like about the remake was the the kids with the masks on that were doing their like parade. I thought was beyond stupid. That was not necessary yes yeah. did it give a creepy effect sure but it had it was dumb like what yeah, kids are had, gonna walk around and do that <laughs> yeah i think that that might have been something from the book but they never actually like i thought and when i seen it in the trailer i thought there was gonna be more to that in the story like leading yeah. up and it showed in the beginning and then it's pretty much there's so they no just drop something it. from the book for shake, sake of dropping it from the book but then give any context yeah exactly right um i i do enjoy the idea that it's you know both movies are based upon bringing an animal back and dealing with grief and being very upset that their cat died and wanting to, like who wouldn't want to bring their pet back i think yeah, it's exactly. a normal reaction but i think that you know i've always felt like selda i understand why selda was included but i always never got that part of the story and i'm sure that's an unpopular opinion i don't have a beef with it being there i just really i know it's about grief and stuff but i feel like that has nothing to do with the outcome. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly what it was, though. Like what you said it, was, it was just showing another character dealing with a past grief. And like I how feel they like handle it. well, we all know. I think Stephen King did a lot of drugs. My understanding. <laughs> oh, right? he did. Yeah. So I feel like he was just like, "Nah, let's make this crazy bitch that like get out of bed and has this disease, and we're gonna like super like." make it crazy and this child's left alone to caregive for this person like you know there's certain parts in it that obviously you need to suspend your disbelief and i do agree the original judd you know sometimes that is better like obviously there's some classic lines from that 1990 film yeah um but the acting in it besides him it's pretty painful <laughs> Yeah, the parents you know, especially. Oh, my gosh. Right? Like, oh. I can say the acting went up leaps and bounds. Yeah. And even when Ellie kills her mother, that scene is very emotional. Oh, it is. Yeah. Right? Um, I didn't agree with them coming back at the end. Oh. All three of them are zombies. And they're and coming to get Gage in the car. You know, I really – and the cats, I think, even walking with them. Like, yeah, well, so yeah, the cats. Stupid. The cat ends up – like, at the very end of the scene, the cat jumps on the hood to look in, to look in the window at Gage. And the like family's right behind it. It's like, so oh, my God. Um, right? And I can't remember the cat's name now. Oh, my Church. God. Church. Thank you, Winston Churchill. Um, <laughs> that's the scene that I was like, oh, come the fuck on. Like, what is this? Um – and, you know, props to them trying to do a reimagination of it. I think the acting was better for that one. And I know we're kind of getting into film review. But what I appreciate about those two movies is that they had the balls to use kids. And they had the balls to, in one of them, kill the kid. You know, yeah. eight guys. And, you know, it's shocking, though, when his wife comes back in the 1991. He's like, oh, shit, yeah, you're back. Awesome. You yeah. know, like, I don't understand. And 
who is the young man that is hit and killed and is the ghost throughout? Oh, it? what the hell is his name? I, I can't it, remember his name either off the top of my head. Look it up. Um, but him coming back and both actors were great, but he was, he startled the shit out of me more than anybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he was te- like, especially in the, cause I can't remember in the remake if it like showed him like all disgusting looking, like he wasn't the original, but man, like Victor, Victor. Yes. Victor. Yeah. He was, uh, he was uh, like the, uh, God, what is the term that they call that? But he's one that's like giving the warnings. Do not go. Do not do this. Yeah, and he kept trying to say to him. And even when he's taken his wife in the original and he keeps being like, don't do it. Don't do it. And he's yep, like, he nope. Walks right through him. No, nope. Lewis, Lewis is like, going to do this shit. <laughs> going to pair my wife and she's going to come back and she's going to fuck shit up for everybody, right? Yep. Um, but both very good, you know, Rise from the Dead zombie movies talking about grief had the balls to use children i give them both props for that and i don't think the remake is as bad as everybody makes it out to be no it was but just I, okay it's just okay would i watch it a second time you know what if it was on television and i had nothing yeah. else to do probably i would watch it yeah. you know i i don't think it's poorly acted i just think the ending makes me roll my eyes that's all yeah and then we're going to get more into the funny side of things and move oh, to yes. Shaun of the dead 2004 which i believe you said is your favorite comedy uh, it's my favorite zombie comedy, like my all-time favorite. Oh, that's true, because you don't like comedy, so. <sighs> my all-time favorite horror comedy now is What We Do in the Shadows. Mm, okay. But this is my favorite zombie comedy of all time. I just love this movie because it pretty much is just like a love letter to all of these old-school zombie films. And they do it with such care and grace while adding, like, the wonderful sense of humor and character development. Because even though it's funny... It's still sad and, like, scary at times. It is sad. Um, And, like, the whole dynamic between Sean and his girlfriend Liz and the issues that they're having and Ed being that awkward best friend that's around. Like, there's some good interpersonal relationships that are there, too. And Barbara and Philip. Yep. and the the relationship he has with philip and eventually what happens to philip and the zombies are slow moving in the part where they throw the tire straights <laughs> and i love like, tire strikes right so i just find that really funny i i love that whole scene because it's like you know they're going through their albums and ed picks up the uh batman soundtrack and sean looks over and goes no put that back throw this yeah. one <laughs> yeah like it's some really clever english humor that goes through it and I do think the zombies are very realistic. How people react is for a comedy, fairly realistic yeah. and how slow moving they are and how they learn to kill them and stuff. But it's true. It makes an assumption that no one's ever seen a zombie film, which is by 2004, you'd be like, all right, dude, like you've probably seen the like a handful at least, right? Yeah. Like, you know, and you probably have an idea of what this could be right now. And they don't really give the percent, the assumption that they're in shock and I do believe this is one of the first true full-length comedies to come out. Now, I'm sure zombies have been made fun of before that, different skits and stuff like that. But I believe this is the first full-length comedy one to come out. Yeah, because there's Return of the Living Dead, but that one's more 80s punk rock horror. I mean, it has a little bit of comedy sprinkled in, but this is more like the full-blown like belly laugh style comedy. Yeah, that's what I would say, too. I, I really don't have too much to go on about this, to be honest with you. I just feel like it's clever. Um, I do like how he keeps um sean keeps ed at the end as kind of a pet yep and, uh, like play video games with and still be like his friend right and i think the zombies look very realistic i don't know is there something you want to add i think you're more passionate about this movie than i am um i would say this one is also just kind of like uh something that just like takes that character of working with or putting individuals together in a situation an awkward situation like liz meeting his mother for the first time and it happened to be during the zombie apocalypse mm. um then the whole uh, Liz's best friend's boyfriend having a crush on Liz and like the jealousy oh, yeah, and all resentment that coming shit. out. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, there's some like, good relationships. This is a really good relationship film. And I think it opened the door for more com- comedic. I don't think we would have had Zombieland if we didn't have Shaun of the Dead. No, I was going to say, because right. yeah, kind of like George Romero was the grandfather of zombies, Shaun of the Dead was the grandfather of the zombie comedy like because this is when zombie comedies became like a huge popular thing after this. absolutely absolutely and then that leads into zombie land yeah. um and i think zombie land is hilarious i so i find I. that movie i'm surprised you do um <laughs> i'm not kidding i'm actually you surprised are. you find that funny because i would have thought you would have hated jesse eisenberg's rules for surviving a zombie attack 
I would have yeah. thought you thought that was the dumbest shit ever. So I am super shocked that you like that. Yeah, well, you know, once again, my comedy is very hard to pinpoint. But yeah, for some reason, this one works with me. Um, Jesse Eisenberg, I, I like him because he's like that dorky, nerdy guy. I probably, I probably would have had a list of ways to survive. Maybe that's why I enjoyed like his list. I think you are Jesse Eisenberg in that film. Yeah. Yeah, I think I would be exactly that way. That's probably why I like like his list and everything like that. And then, I mean, the comedy with Woody Harrelson like, being the badass he is, but like also just like obs- his obsession with trying to like find the last Twinkies and <laughs> and Wichita and Little Rock. Yes, are such bitches. Oh, they are, and like, they're not much better in the second movie either. No, and I I thought it was interesting how um, self sustaining they were and how quick and fast these zombies were. And in the second zombie land, they, you know, begin to, to show categories of zombies. And I thought all his rules made sense. Yeah. And I think it really took, I feel like they knew about zombies. I feel like zombie land was like, yeah, zombie success. We got what happened. So these are the rules we developed and there's some background, you know, cause Bill Murray comes out dressed like a zombie. That's supposed yeah. to be like a funny zombie, right? Like one of those Dawn of the dead or, Night of the Living Dead zombies. So I feel like there's some kind of knowledge of the culture in that one, which I do find clever. And yep. the scene where they're at the amusement park, like, what a dumb idea, though. Like, I know where, and I get that she was trying to cheer up her little sister, and they take her to the amusement park and turn on all this shit. And of course, you're going to attract every zombie basically around. Basically, concept animals here, right? Like, animals yeah. are going to see light and noise, and they're going to go to it. And that scene where they're on the ride that blasts off and brings them down and blasts off, like, holy fuck is it anxiety driven. I <laughs> yeah. actually wasn't sure who was going to survive in that movie. I really didn't know. And I think Shaun of the Dead, we can thank for that as well, because Ed gets turned into a zombie. Yeah. And I didn't think that was going to happen. Yeah, exactly. You know, so I think that that, that movie with Zombieland is you don't know if they're the four of them are actually going to make it out. Well, I mean, who would have thought Bill Murray would have got killed off? No, you know what? I, and looking back when you do it a second watch, I'm like, yeah, you see that coming. Yeah, you see it, but like right? for the first time, though, you don't. No, the first time you don't. And I feel like we have this movie to also thank for one movie that I really like that Scott probably hates is Warm Bodies. And I didn't put it on here. It's a yeah. 2013. Yep, knew it. Scott hates it because he has no taste. Um, but Warm <laughs> Bodies is a really fun, short little movie. It is a romantic comedy. And it's basically about zombies that all of a sudden – get some humanity in them and of course it's a little silly on how it happens but i don't think we would have had warm bodies if we didn't have zombie land warm bodies came out in 2013 and it kind of brought zombies then into more like out of the horror genre into the mainstream it allowed people to go you know I want to watch a zombie film and not be ridiculously scared, but maybe have some scenes that are a little scary, quote unquote. That's what those movies did, which I give them credit for. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And like, I wouldn't say I hate this movie. It was just another one that I thought was okay. Well, we won't go into it because Scott has no taste. So we're <laughs> going to do whatever talk you want about Dance of the Dead. No, we, I don't want to be doing a 15-hour podcast on zombies. So uh, Dance of the Dead 2008. This one is comical. It's, it's a great one to check out. I can't remember where I watched it now. I think I watched it on Prime. I feel like I watched it on Prime or maybe I watched it on a good friend's Plex. But um, it came out in 2008, so you should be able to find it. It's basically a low-budget zombie film about zombies that overtake a high school dance prom night. And I find it really funny. And honestly, you're going through this movie and you're not sure who's going to survive. And some of the main characters get offed. And in one scene, this guy's in love with this cheerleader girl and he's like the nerd of the sci-fi club. She gets bit. She ends up biting him, and they end up having this zombie makeout session, and it's really fucking funny. And then eventually they get killed because this over, like, right-wing gym teacher ends up leading them to secure this. Like, it's very much a product of its time from 2008 because you see the Confederate flag in it, and I hate the Confederate flag, but at least in this film they're kind of making fun of it, so I'm fine with it. Um, but yeah, it's it's a fun it's a fun little movie. It's definitely comedy based. The zombies are slow moving. Uh, they kind of have an idea of what they are because they come back in a graveyard. The first scene you see is this couple parked at a graveyard and or cemetery, and the zombies come up. So it's very resident, like very much Night of the Living Dead inspired, uh, but fun. It's a fun film. If you enjoyed um Shaun of the Dead I would put this more in the category of Shaun of the Dead than I would Zombie Land. I almost feel like Zombie Land and Warm Bodies kind of dance in a little bit of the same circles. Yeah, so. I can see that. Right. And then you have one to talk about here as well. 
Yep, I, I figured I'd just bring this one up briefly, uh, but it's uh, 1979's Lucio Fulci's Zombie, or Zombie 2, Zombie Flesh Eaters, or Dawn of the Dead 2. Like, there's multiple titles when it comes to the Italian horror films. Um, but this one, it's about zombies that had gotten brought back by a Haitian curse, and that, uh, which is kind of uh, funny since, like, or actually, yeah, I think it was Haitian, but like Haitian curse, so it, like, fits with the whole where zombies came from originally. And this uh, ship comes back to the mainland of America and has uh, this main character's father in it who is a zombie. So they end up going back to this island to try to figure out what the hell happened and why their dad, why her dad was coming back to life. And like the story just unravels from there, but it just, this is like the, one of the first representations of a true, like showing really old dead bodies coming back to life like uh one like it's got one of the most iconic zombies ever i think and that is the uh very decayed zombie on the cover of the dvd and blu-ray where it's got like the maggot and mealworms coming out of its eye holes and there's like it has no eyes and it's rotted like and a lot of these zombies like on this island are from the spanish inquisition so they're still wearing old spanish armor like the armor from the spanish inquisition and all that so I just thought I'd kind of bring that up because, yeah, it was like that one's like the true coming back from the dead. Like even the old dead are coming back in this one. And it's because of a curse instead of like yeah. a bite. Excellent. I haven't seen it, but it sounds like it falls more to the traditional uh, idea of zombies. And we have that to thank for the development and the makeup and the look of zombies that we see now. Yeah. That's cool. Awesome. Yeah, I just wanted to bring that one up briefly for that one. Awesome. So our next sub genre of zombie quote unquote which i don't even know if these are zombies you know it's infection yeah but they get thrown into the sub category of zombies but are they really zombies you know and i think there's a debate about this in the horror community because we debate everything so i don't like i'm fine with throwing them in i don't really care i would never be like no that's an infection movie and that's a zombie movie and they don't belong together i i do think that the source is different but i don't know if these movies like they kind of follow the same plot line they do Right? Like there isn't like, there isn't too much difference like besides like obviously like the way that the disease is transmitted type deal. Right. So first one we're going to talk about is the Crazies uh, that came out in 2010. Now I believe there's an original The Crazies, and yep, I don't think I've seen that. That's also a George Romero film. And I have, have not you seen, seen it? I have not seen that one. Okay. So we unfortunately from 1973, The Crazies, we will not be able to talk about that one because. Uh, Scott and I are bad people and we haven't seen it. So we will just be talking about the 2010. Uh, another short running time, an hour and 41 minutes. I wonder if the George A. Romano one was longer. Uh, this one did pretty good, I think, um, for a follow-up. It, uh, it made 50 million, 55 million US and with a budget of 20. So that tells me that it probably did pretty good comparably to the original. I didn't give the stats for the other one because I was just curious because we haven't seen the original Crazies if this one was received well because i think a lot of times people don't like to watch remakes right uh, they have you know we all know horror community people get really up in, up in arms about it and i figured because you hadn't seen the crazies i was beginning to the original i was beginning to think this one's more of a cult classic which means people get even angrier if it's remade <laughs> so- <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I, it, and I think you're pretty much right on the head with that i think it is more considered a cult classic right so i'm sure there's lots of people that are like it's the best movie ever and they're mad that we're talking about the 2010 but i enjoyed the 2010 so did i um a lot i i thought one of the opening scenes at the baseball game um it's a local small community and you got this sheriff and it seems like not much goes on in the town they kind of just basically dealing with your basic hooligans you know, maybe some knocking over mailboxes and some other mischief like that. And they're at this baseball game and one of these guys is acting real crazy and the sheriff is forced to shoot him. Yep. And things just go from there. And his wife is the town doctor and she starts noticing that stuff is happening. People start acting real weird. Um, and eventually you find out that it comes from the water supply. And when they figure that out, And they go to the mayor to do something. The mayor's like, no, I'm not going to do anything about this. It's going to look bad and we don't need the publicity and da, 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 da. Very realistic. Yeah. Look at the Flint water issue. Right. (laughs) (laughs) That is so true. Not to attack your your area, Scott, but when I see this movie, I think of Flint. Not because I think a whole bunch of crazy people running around Flint, but because I think of that mayor's reaction to being like, 
prove it's the water. You can't prove that it's the water. It's it's fine. Everything and not wanting to do a single thing about it, and saying right. if you do something about it, you're going to be in trouble. Like I don't want anything to be done here. And then of course it escalates to the point where um, the army is called in, and eventually people are just well, genocide occurs. Right? They basically kill off everybody who they think could be affected, and they try to like give the impression that maybe you'll be saved if you're not. Yeah. Like, those temperatures and stuff like that it sounds very familiar to now Mm -hmm. um (laughs) so does and i i always thought that this movie was definitely falls more into the realm i would say of science fiction but i think that it's it's a really good film of what would probably and and the closest that we're seeing right now to covid obviously yet again i'm not saying covid is like this but if we had an infection to this level that was from the water that would make people sick i really feel like this is what would happen like yeah. I feel like it's like, yep, that's how it would go down. <laughs> yeah. Very realistic. Yeah. And I, I think that's yet again that best fantasy of horror. And I'll be honest, I don't think I would survive this situation. I think I am a very trusting of authority and I think I would go to this army thing and not realize that I was gonna get killed. I would get put into that truck thinking I was gonna live, and basically people were just killed. And I get why they made those decisions. As angry as you are, I understand the bigger picture of it. Yeah. But it's a very, very good movie. It, did you have anything you wanted to add? I kind of went on a rant there. No, I'll say I think you pretty much covered everything because this is one of those I've seen once a long time ago and like around the time that it got released. So like certain key scenes I remember, which were the ones you brought up. I don't remember the rest very well. I just, you know, I remember that opening scene with the baseball diamond and yep. the reaction um, of David the Sheriff and and just, you know, or even the doctor when she's seeing and treating that man and she's asking him questions and he just keeps repeating himself over and over again. Like, it's just so well done. It really is. Really, really well done. So the next one is Train to Brisson, which I don't think anyone in the horror movie could praise this any more than we already have, but uh, I'll let you go on and see what you have to say. Yeah, this is one that it's a uh kind of reminded me when i watched it of like 28 days later with the way that this infection and zombie infection zombie virus was spreading really fast because the people that got infected reanimated really really quickly which made this very hard virus to contain because it just got out of hand really fast and once again shows like this is a typical trope in a lot of zombie films now is the forced to work together with people you don't know and can't get along with because yes. you have like a wide variety of characters and kind of like what we were talking about with how people were acting during COVID, this is exactly the situation. Like you have the people that are all about protecting themselves and others that are wanting to work together to help each other, others that are there just to help their family. It's just a vari- wide variety mix of people, which causes a chaotic soup of emotions and chaos. And the mass use of zombies, like when we look at the volume of people and the waves that were happening, the waves of zombies coming in, that isolation of being on the train. And when that one guy gets on the train and you're like, fuck, don't let him on. Yep. Right. Or I think a guy or a girl, I can't remember. I think it was a girl. Was it a girl? And the slow infection. And even for the characters that we meet briefly, you feel for them. Yeah let alone the main characters and the sacrifice and you know the fact that that pregnant woman lived to this day i never saw that coming and she and her husband or the gentleman that played her husband had the best chemistry oh they really did it was just and the little girl and at the end when the father sacrificed himself to basically protect the daughter the daughter and the pregnant woman Yep. Um, and his whole character shift that occurs in that film. And the volume, like, I can't get over the waves of people. And you feel that, that overwhelmingness of these mass amount of people chasing these two, these three characters. Yeah. And somehow they get away. And if it wasn't for that jerk on the train, mm-hmm. um, you know, probably the father would have survived but even when she's walking through when they're walking through the tunnel and the little girl starts singing yes because you're thinking they're going to get shot you're like oh my god let you know night of living dead all over again i was waiting for that to happen you know they're going to shoot these two and she starts singing 
oh my god it even got me like a little emotional and like she doesn't die and they don't and they make it it's such a good movie like i don't I don't know who could watch Train to Busan and not walk out of that movie and be emotionally invested in it. Right. Like I like this is why like the genre, like the community praises this film for like the way we do cuz it just kind of came out of nowhere for us and just like if you are It came out of nowhere for us in North America. Yeah. That's that's what I meant by like that. <laughs> right? But like but yeah, it was just kind of like a just something we didn't expect and like especially in the zombie genre like at at the time especially it was a lot of the zombie comedies and stuff like that and this one was one of those very serious ones that and very serious to what would happen yeah like the mass panic and the and the letting people on the train and certain people turning on other characters and the untrust yep so realistic you know and and there's going to be a sequel as we all know I I I will watch the sequel. I don't think this movie needs a sequel. I also didn't it, think it needed a prequel. I think yeah. it did a great job of introducing that there was a government testing gone bad. Here's the aftermath of it. These two survive. You know, yep, we exactly. know that we know that, you know, everything's fucked. Okay, for lack of a better word, we know everything's fucked. Okay. And we see the bravery that people pull through. I'm thinking of the train conductor, mm-hmm. uh, his bravery and his focus to keep driving that train as all that shit like we forget about that character yeah and how he went bravely to f- try to find another train like this right. guy risked his life and, and he did die you know he did trying to save or the young men on the f- on the on the soccer team and how he sees his buddies have changed and he's unable to hit them that's yep. realistic yeah you know and and the other two guys are like okay this kid and they don't even get mad at him because of it there's like this understanding yeah that's what i was gonna say like uh that's like you get these different groups of characters but you get to like know all of them in such a short amount of time and like you are invested in every single one of them because they do such a good job of making you believe in them and their beliefs well and it reflects human behavior and yeah yes like let's say i'm at your house okay and i saw me apocalypse happens and tim turns i would probably have to be the one to take tim down you could probably not do it yeah and I would not fault you for that. You would be upset and I would do whatever I had to do in that situation for us to survive. And as sad as I would be because I do know Tim, it's not going to be the same. Right. Right. And I think that that's what that movie captured so well. And that's why we relate with it so well. We look at that and we go, holy shit, if that was me and those were my friends, I don't know if I could do what needed to be done. Because not that long ago, him and his friends were fighting off and saving people. Right. Right. So... It's it's a really good way to develop characters. Yet again, that fantasy of us putting ourselves in that situation going, I would react like that. I would feel like that. Um, and nailed it. Just nailed it. Train to Busan, nailed it. Um, another movie that I think does a good job of this, only it's more based in fantasy, is Overlord. Oh, yeah. Right? So Overlord came out in 2018, and it's based in World War II. And it's based in Nazi experiments and infection and this basically this virus that makes them um, unstoppable. And there's some really tough scenes in there. Yeah, there really is. There's one scene where one of the main characters is about to be sexually assaulted. Oh, and yeah. There is, um, and when there's that kind of stopping of it, you're like, fuck yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? Like you're you're definitely invested and i think you probably saw this movie too i've been doing a lot of talking but is there something you wanted to talk about before i go into more detail on overlord uh go ahead on this one because i'm trying to remember there's certain scenes once again it's one of those that i just vaguely remember well they're basically in a town and i'm trying to check to see where the country was that they were located in and it's a group of basically it's a troop and they're fighting Nazis and they realize that they have created this kind of Nazi testing place to kind of create Nazis to become super, become superhuman basically. And they're able to fight off and and kill people. And there is a sacrifice that is done by one of the main lieutenants, but it basically shows the concept of injections and the concept of our fear of supernatural weapons right if we look at you know the idea of enhancing people to fight back this is what the movie really represented it yeah. really built into your feelings for the main characters especially for the female that's introduced as well um the fact that she tries to protect these troops and keep them safe um it's a really good war film 
that has infection sprinkled into it. Yeah, because I would, uh, I'm thinking of things now, and but like, uh, yeah, like they've always, like there have always been like the rumors of the Nazi experiments of uh, people, yes. like them trying to do, uh, make super soldiers for these wars. Mm -hmm. Like whether that's actually based in reality or not, but that's been a, like a rumor that's floated around pretty much since World War II, because I'm sure some of these Nazis probably did inject people just to like, try to make them stronger and fight longer and i mean obviously probably didn't turn them into zombies and whatnot but well they weren't technically zombies either they were infected right right they were infected with basically roids yeah really like a rage yeah they had the, with the rage roids <laughs> right um and which made sense because the nazis wanted to become a superior race right so if we're looking also at the the racism and the class side of it this would make very sense for the nazis plan yeah um very good movie that sprinkles in some history with obviously not being overly accurate but right. very very interesting very good film it's a 2018 film if for some reason you missed out on this film i highly recommend checking it out yep i remember having a good time with this one too so like, yeah, yeah I it's up there for me as one of my top infection films um definitely up there as well as Sumbies. uh Sumbies <laughs> 2016 movie and i want to give a second to give a shout out again to paul stevenson all my love, my friend. Miss your podcast very much. You covered this on Who Will Survive. You Did he Marco. really? Oh, yeah. He covered Aww. this in uh, Somber Beaver, or Zombie Beavers or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, you know, for a made-for-TV movie, which I feel like it was, it was pretty fucking funny. Um, basically, these, um, these animals are in this endangered, <laughs> like, sanctuary and <laughs> they get this rage virus basically it's a rage virus and they go like crazy and they basically take over the zoo and there's some pretty bad cgi but i feel like walking into zombies you go this is going to be a really dumb movie about animals that are zombies and i'm just going to enjoy it and i thought the acting for the movie was fine and i thought how yeah. people reacted would be fine like it, all of a sudden you had these monkeys and these giraffes that were going like fucking AWOL on you. I don't think you'd be like, oh, yeah, this seems like super normal. Yeah, this, like, this, yeah, this is a normal day. <laughs> like, one chick panics and, like, pieces off with the Jeep. I, mean, yep. I think that would happen. I think you would have somebody that would be like, fuck this shit, I'm gone. So I, that I, I absolutely had no problem with. Is I, yet again, it's a silly movie, and I think if you enjoy silly, stupid films, and your name is Heather, not Scott, yeah. you will enjoy this movie. Because hey, I, it is have you seen it? I, I, t I told you I enjoyed oh, it. I right. thought it was dumb fun. It's dumb fun, right? But the part where the chick pieces, I'm like, that would happen. Yeah. Like, you know, and the one chick that's like, no, I got to protect the Avery and all these endangered birds. That's There's probably someone out there that would, ha that would have that happen. Because oh, for sure. To our next movie, which is 28 Days Later, that's where the virus started from. Yeah. Right? It was animals that were infected that people were like, we're going to free them from this lab. And then, uh oh, which, now the know, infection spreads. Right, which I would be all about, like all the yeah. Animals, I'm, oh, for sure. I'd like, be I, patient zero, you know, in that situation. I'd be the dumbass that caused the end of the world. Um, you heard it here first on Friday Nightmares. So, what do you think of Twenty Eight Days Later, two thousand and two? Um, this is one that I haven't seen since about two thousand and two, but I remember and enjoying it as well because this is like I, one of the first times that I've seen the fast moving infected. And yep. it was truly terrifying. And I think Walking Dead stole from this a little bit, like, because of the big thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> they especially. They were inspired. They were inspired. Yeah. Well, I'll say, especially the very first pilot episode of Walking Dead, because it happens the exact same way. Rick wakes up in the hospital. No one's around from a coma. Just like this main character does, wakes up from a coma. No one's around. And, like, ends up coming, going outside and trying to figure out what's going on. And, yeah, that's pretty much what Walking Dead did. No, but, I've never seen an episode of The Walking Dead. Oh, you're not missing much now. I know. I feel like I just dropped this bomb, and I was waiting for you to be like, oh, my God. And you're like, nah, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I, I made it to season three and just said, meh. You're like, all right, I get it. We're still walking dead. <laughs> yeah, we're, you're still walking. They're still dead, and your characters suck. <laughs> what um, I think is great about this film is that it's filmed in Great Britain, right? It's based in yeah. Great Britain. Um, and I think the characters are all very likable. Jim is very likable. He wakes up, he wanders around. I love how he doesn't take his like hospital gown off. And he right. Just, like, walks around in it and is like, hello, hello. And I think you would be like that. You'd be fucking shocked. Yeah, because you're like, what the hell happened? Where is everybody? 
Now, I never got why the infected didn't attack him. Was it because he was sleeping? I think so. Like, Or maybe because he was comatose and they thought he was dead because he was in a coma? Like, I don't... Yeah, they never really explain good, that. That is a very good question I never thought of, actually. Right? And I just assumed it was because he was coma-based. That they might were, be, yeah. Oh, shit, dude's, dude's passed out. Dude had a good time! <laughs> <laughs> right? Just get really hand and pass out. Um, and I do enjoy that he meets up with the survivors, and they continue on. So there's Hannah, and then there's a young girl, and there's a, uh, another woman who's in it as well so they have the activists are the first ones that they list i love that the activists are in it for like 15 seconds and then they're out right um uh, selena it must be selena and they are found by those other kind of militia people and then they're going to rape hannah and selena oh, tries yeah. to sacrifice herself and goes no no take me take me you want me you don't want her and i totally you know not to be i could see myself doing that in that situation too if i was with a young lady and these guys were going to do shit i'd be like do it to me do whatever right. you want to me, but leave her. Like, I think that was very realistic to how another woman would want to protect another female, whether that's a motherly instinct or a female instinct or not. The scene with Hannah's father, where he gets the blood in his eye. Yeah. And he's like, I want you to know that I love you very much. And, and she's like, why, well, dad, what's wrong? And they kind of put together what Jim kind of puts together, what they're going to need to do because he sees what's happening. It's a really, really good emotional film. And I do feel like that, started the infection zombie outbreak bar oh it did right and, and i it, think sorry go ahead i was saying it did a unique unique way with the way the infection spread because it wasn't just through bites it was actually like just like spreading a virus yeah like through just like the droplets in the air or well like it's actually similar through, through hiv right yeah so the idea of blood on blood contact yeah right which is very very interesting and i don't know if that was supposed to be a comparison or not that they were doing or if they just thought it would make the most sense right that the virus is in your blood and your blood goes throughout your entire body um i do think it's interesting as well as that the dead died of starvation yeah right or the the infected side of star died of starvation or started to and then we have the 28 weeks later which is a follow-up to this movie yep, which i did not get a chance to see i was looking for a copy of that one but i couldn't find it yeah and i think that's something we can bring up in a in another time so the rest are yours so i'll let you talk oh, well one's mine but i'll let you talk about them all right so yep well i'll go back to 1985 and talk about return of the living dead i put this one in this category because of the experiment experimentation part because just like in overlord with the nazi super soldiers there was a chemical called trioxin um that was used to reanimate the dead for war to like use as soldiers and in, in this movie and unfortunately like somehow a canister ends up being uh put into this mortuary or yeah morgue and well someone like some dumb character decides oh i'm gonna show the newbie this uh secret uh government uh weapon that's down here that we found years ago and don't like it don't know what to do with it and he bangs on the barrel and it like cracks open and the gas leaks out which is how all the undead come back to life. And what I find interesting about this is these undead, it's just never ending. Because when the gas gets out into the air, it's bringing back freshly dead skeletons that have decayed all the way down to their bones. It's bringing back everything that is decayed. And, and it's died. bringing sexy back. And it's bringing sexy back, just like <laughs> me. <laughs> um, and, it, and it even infects... Uh, people that are alive if they breathe the gas and they try to get rid of the body by chopping it up and every part of the body is still moving on its own individually they so they go to the next resort which is burning it and when they burn it it releases the gas from the body into the air once again infecting more people infecting more zombies and it's like a never-ending thing like it you can't stop this it's just it'll eventually just take over the world. Because, I mean, even at the end of the movie, they drop a nuclear bomb on the city, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, you hear in radio station talk like, oh, so it started raining after the nuclear war, or after the nuclear bomb dropped, and people are saying that it burns like acid when it touches the skin, which is how the chemical is getting back into people's bodies and bringing back the dead again. I just thought that was a very fascinating like storyline for like a never-ending horde of undead, which basically just doomed the entire Earth. 
Oh, I feel like this is an environmental movie that's masked as a science movie, to be honest with, or a zombie movie. I didn't like it that much when I first saw it. I thought it was stupid. Someone bought it for me, and I watched it once, and I thought it was the dumbest movie I ever watched. Um, Wow. I think, yeah, I really thought it was dumb, but I think now I would have a different appreciation for it. Um, But yeah, so I really don't have much to say about it, because I thought it was stupid. I didn't want to rewatch it. So (laughs) I appreciate that you talked about it, because maybe I will. Yeah, because this is one that I watch every year, and I'll actually... This may be my first rewatch of the year because it's a tradition of mine to watch this on July 3rd because it happens on July 3rd. You're such a nerd. No, wait, I am. Continue. Continue. But we'll see if that happens or not. But anyways, um, the next one I am going to talk about is Let Sleeping Corpses Lie from 1974, also known as The Living Dead at Manchester Borg, and I believe also known as Don't Open the Window. <laughs> and then like You're seven such more a titles. Nerd. <laughs> oh my God. You hey. love it. Everybody loves it. <laughs> I bring the knowledge, baby. Oh, yeah, it's true. I know nothing. Good point, Scott. No, you, you, I, I'm not saying that. <laughs> but uh, now this one I thought was uh, very interesting because this was not really exper- like an experimentation on the corpses or like bringing back the dead. This was more like an accidental uh, experiment because what, what happens is this machine is created that sprays out radiation that is supposed to like deter away or kill the pests and insects that would like eat away at farmland and like all the farming produce and all that stuff. But what accidentally happens is this radiation accidentally reanimates the dead. And like, it, that just, uh, they don't know why it's doing it or what happened or how it happened, but like they eventually figure out that, that was the reason for it, which I just thought that was a fascinating one. I've only seen it once. I watched it for the Horror Drunks podcast, so I don't remember a whole heck of a lot of it now, but I just thought the way that the corpses got reanimated was like an accidental experimentation. I thought that was just kind of interesting and wanted cool. to bring that up. Yeah, I, I've never even heard of it, so maybe it's something I'll definitely check out. Yeah, it's it's a very good zombie movie, I will say that. Nice. And then the other one, obviously, is another classic, but uh, Reanimator. Oh, of course, we, yeah. I mean, this is kind of along the lines of just experimenting, bringing the dead back, super soldier style, except for this one they cannot control the dead every time they bring them back they just kind of the undead just go completely crazy and they still have a lot of their memories they can still talk some of them can and it's more along the lines of a story about obsession as this herbert west wants to continue to keep bringing back the dead oh the older dead didn't work all right let's bring in the fresh okay this one just freshly died maybe this will work to infect it oh nope that one went crazy too and i had to kill that one and it just it's chaos but yeah i figure that's just another brief one because a lot of people know reanimator but that i fit, thought felt like it fit yeah it's a very classic uh science experiment movie gone wrong and even the term reanimate reanimator it's like to to movement of something right to get something yeah. back to life and i think that that's you know yet again our our struggle between death and life and and wanting to bring things back better and be more improved so yeah it's a good film like i've only seen it once um but i did enjoy it probably not as much as other people do but i do have a lot of respect for it and i do think it's a it's one of those must watch for a horror fan for sure oh it definitely is and then this one we're gonna go to new zealand from the 1990s with Peter Jackson's Brain Dead, or also known as Dead Alive. Brain, man, Peter Jackson, man. Like, he came up with some weird shit before he got to Lord of the Rings. Oh my gosh. And it's like, it blew my mind when he got to Lord of the Rings. It's like, holy crap, the guy that did the most violent horror movie ever made it gets this epic fantasy now? Yeah, Interesting. totally, right? Totally. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this one is... Uh, God, I can't remember the name of the virus, but it's from the Sumatran rat monkey that is uh, found in this, uh, on Skull Island, because he was obsessed with King Kong. Yeah. And so he found the rat monkey, like this explorers find this rat monkey, they capture it and bring it back to the zoo. And it's in the cage and it's a, literally a weird claymation rat slash monkey. It's just horrifying looking. And it ends up biting the main character's mother. Oh who ends up getting infected and just it's extremely gross and like this is where a lot of the, like the body fluids and grossness come into play and but yeah it's just like and she and then since she's infected when she bites somebody she infects them and so on and so on the chain just goes on just like a typical zombie and this one is more like a true zombie film in the way it happens have you seen this one no it's one of the ones that i feel like <clears throat> I've kind of avoided. 
Um, I didn't mean to cough at that moment to say no. that. I just happened to cough. Um, but yeah, I think eventually I might check it out, but it's never been something that's been an, a big watch for me, to be honest with you. I recommend this one. I It's hilarious. I mean, in the... Neil Strickland it, and Gremlins, so we'll see. But you loved Gremlins. <laughs> I, I like. I did. See? So... <laughs> but no, like I, this one's just another must see that also fit in the infection because yeah, just I thought that was a unique idea that it was from a creature that already lived in the world and that had this disease in it, and it was called like the Zika disease or Zingaya disease or something like that. And uh, yeah, just it's one of those just must see zombie gore films, especially for someone from Peter Jackson. Cool, you. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. And our final category, unknown source of infection. So this is where we don't know. And and actually, most of the movies are serious. Yeah. Um, so Ravenous is a 2017 French-Canadian film. And it you never find out who the infected are. There's one I had on here already, which is Blood Contrum. But I feel like Fresh Cuts, we covered that and we already talked about it a lot before. And I didn't know what new we could add to it. So I did take it out. Okay. Um, but go back and listen to Fresh Cuts on it because I think that goes into more detail on the political side of it. And I've already talked about it in other episodes. But Ravenous, um, it's a survivalist. It really is. Like the people that survive in this are the people that like know how to use guns and are very cautious and aware of their surroundings at all times and when people turn they still seem to be able to function and communicate but they work as a group and they seem to be obsessed with piling furniture and chairs and objects up to the ceiling so if it's adults it's adult products if it's children it's children's products so i'm sure there's a deeper meaning behind that um, French films usually do have more of a deeper meaning behind things. And throughout this film, there's a group of people that you follow. One woman is a working woman that, man, did I, I, I represent with this woman. She's like, my career has been everything. You know, I was getting my nails done when this happened. I wasn't at home with my kids cause I can't stand my husband. And, and she basically becomes the badass and sacrifice herself at, oh, wow. at the end of the movie. Right. Along with some other, everyone sacrificed themselves for one little girl that survives. And it is so well done. All the actions that occur in this movie is like it was actually happening. This was a movie that took that if an infection broke out and you had no idea what it was and all you knew is that these people were crazy if they, if they got to you and if you turned, you would become like that, you would avoid them at all costs and you would do exactly what all these people did. And I got to say, most of the decisions are smart that they make. Or, or at least they make sense for the situation. So they're either barricading themselves and there's older people, younger people, or there's these two old women that are badasses. And they fuck shit up until one of them gets turned. And when the one gets turned, the other one kills them. Oh, and wow. eventually sacrifices herself to save this little... Like, everyone ends up sacrificing themselves for this one little girl who does get saved at the end. Oh, and wow. you don't know what she's going to be saved to because you have no idea what is outside of this. So it's very much like, yet again, what are you being saved for? But it is a solidly made film, high character development, very intense, very reflective of survival nature, and most people moving away from their individualistic needs and working together as a team. And also, I think some deeper meanings in there that I just didn't get. Right. Have you seen it? No, this is the one that I was going to try to get to before we recorded today, but I did not have the time last Watch night. Watch it on Netflix. Yeah, that's, I planned on it because you were talking yeah. really highly of this one. It's, so this it's is what definitely I see. Canadian, French Canadians, man. They, they get shit done. Um, the next one I watched was an Irish film called The Cure. And this is based upon uh, a group of people that have been infected that have been cured and have been released to society. And then the 25% that hasn't been cured, that is... Um, not responding to the vaccine and it shows some real discrimination that people would feel is very similar to people that are replaced from jail so whatever their lives may have been beforehand they're no longer to continue they're no longer able to go back to that so one guy was a politician he can't go back to that one guy was i think a lawyer he couldn't go back to that but it the crimes that they committed is that they were infected right so the idea is that they had this rage virus they weren't in the right state of mind so it's a real play on how we view crime in society reflected with the affection 
um, how people are treated once they exit the system. And even if they've been reformed, can they really be reformed? And I don't want to give the ending away to this because I really think people should watch it. If you are a fan of the zombie genre, genre and has one, or infected genre or whatever and have wondered what would happen if there was a cure, this is what would happen. This is reflective of how society would respond. Yeah, I am very curious about this one because, yeah, this is one you were watching last yesterday and you were telling yeah. me all about it. And I knew a bit about it from a podcast a while back. And, yeah, I really find this idea very fascinating and uh, hear that it's, like, a lot darker than I expected, too, with the way it's handled. Very dark, but Ellen Page is in it. She's a Canadian actress. She's phenomenal. Um, there's some other great Irish actors that are in it, also phenomenal. And yet again, this is reflective. If there was an infection in society, a vaccine was found, and we believe that we could change people back to being normal. But these people also have PTSD because they remember what they did. Yeah. Right? So you also see people that are not remorseful for it and people that are and the lines that are drawn and some great relationship development and some excellent dialogue it's an hour and a half long it flies by it's heavy it's worth a watch if you like zombie and infected films yeah this is and one that i will definitely be watching at some point totally now this was the one that you brought up to me so i'll let you introduce it oh uh, yes uh the battery from uh 2012 now this one is kind of where i see a lot of the zombie genre kind of going now and that is the more very personal story mm -hmm. with very few characters. Similar to the Ravenous, actually, because there's, 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 okay. there's only about five characters. Like, there's a couple at the beginning, but they get killed off. So there's really only five main ones that you follow. Okay, because, yeah, this one follows, like, I think it was just two friends. Two. And that, that's, that's all you follow the whole entire yeah. time. Like, and you see what the... Because you don't know the reason I put it in this category, or the reason it's put in this category is because you don't know where the infection or the source of the zombie virus came from. Well, you're dropped in right in the middle. Yeah, you're dropped yeah. in after everything's already happened, and like people there have been surviving in this world for who knows how long. Mm -hmm. And but yeah, you see what it, like what the lasting effects of living in this world can do to you. Because I mean, you get the young guy that's like masturbating to a zombie woman because there's no other woman around like so he can't even use his imagination because this is all he sees anymore is zombies yep you and you just see like how much this isolation starts getting to both of them and the same time like how much they're getting on each other's nerves and like the just constant deterioration like but at the same time the showing of love for one another oh yeah the bond that they've built like it is just one of those just hard to watch films because it's just like so depressing like because it's really not a happy film no and it's a film though that uses its scenes very well um you can tell it's a low budget film but it doesn't give a low budget feel the yeah. writing in it carries it very well and i think that that's the difference with this film and it's very realistic to how people would probably behave and what they bring up in this film is why are we running what is the point yeah. Right. And they talk about the, we're three months in at this point because they go back to talk about when they were barricaded in a house and they talk about the people that have died and how they had to kill a dog and how they had to eat it and how they had to do those things to survive. And I think when you look at that, it really points to what is the point? Yeah. It's very futile. Running? And that's why when they hear about kind of what they think is a um, community that they think has been created, the one character wants to get into that community, even though he's being rejected. Um, because of that sense of self and society, right? Like, yeah. Because what are you, what are what is the point? Like, I actually, when I watched this movie, this is what really made me think of what is the point? Because at the end of Twenty Eight Days Later, you know, at the end of Ravenous, the girls kind of picked up, and it's a very heroic scene. And at in the Cure, you know, majority of the people are cured, so you see the hope. In the Battery, you're like, what the fuck? Like, right? What am I? What am I working towards? There's so little knowledge and they just keep moving and they just keep moving and there's no real sense of self. There's no real sense of connection. And I feel like that's what the battery really hit on. Um, yeah, but really, just really that well. really heavy depression of just realizing that this is the world we live in and like we just got to like, you're only living to survive. There is Absolutely. no other reason to live at that point. Absolutely. And then finally, Pawnee Pool, which is a movie that is based on a small country, like a small town in Canada. Yeah. And uh, I loved it because they referred to the OPP and other things, and it was super Canadian. Uh, uh, OPP stands for Ontario Provincial Police, and 
And it's yet again a film that uses its budget very well. It's it's a gentleman in a radio station, and this shit's going down around them, and they begin to realize that it, you're infected through words in the English language, and they speak yeah. French. And I'm like, holy fuck, is this like a play on fucking like English, like privilege and shit, or what? Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's it's a very politically like underlined movie that you could just be like, oh, it's about languages. But if you look at it deeper, you're like, no. Ah. <laughs> yep, like especially if you're uh, from your country and yes. you know you know a lot of the political stuff that's going on there. Like yes. it makes a lot of sense. Like I I picked up on a little bit of it just because I've learned from you. Yeah, like, it was very much the fact that they could speak French. And there was another gentleman that I think um, the doctor was speaking Arabic. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure that was the language he was speaking. And you know, it had a lot to do with people that have these other skill sets and kind of ties into blood quantum as well. Um, that aren't you know, a way, a main language that is spoken by individuals that are white. And I'm not saying that was the whole point of this movie uh, because white people speak French and other languages too, but English is very much seen as a primary language. And when the moment that that was seen as something that was challenging, as well as it looked at the linguistics of English, because you phrases in English can be used for so many different things. Um, well, other languages, words mean one thing. Yeah, exactly. Right? So I thought that was really interesting, too. There's probably more of the tie on it than the other piece of it. But it's even that idea that everyone needs to speak English. And anyway, it's it's a really well done film. It uses its scene scenes well. The the work that and the and the atmosphere they build just from using radio conversations is out of this world good. Um, yeah, like you even feel like you feel emotion for the guy that they have on the scene that you don't ever actually see. You just yeah. hear them through the radio and just like the emotions that they portray through that. Like the acting is out of this world. Yeah. The it's acting incredible. is so good. And you know, these are Canadian actors and not huge Canadian actors either. Like some of them award one Gemini's and no one knows what a fucking Gemini is. Maybe Christian knows what a Gemini is and he doesn't even listen to this show. So, <laughs> you know, like I think most Canadians don't even know what that is either. So, um, very, very good film. I really recommend it. Yet again, realistic to what I think would happen. Yeah, and you know, pro and probably one of the most unique zombie films that I have ever seen with the way that the infection is. Like absolutely. it is just so freaking unique. And like whoever thought of this, fucking bravo. Like yeah. this is something I would have never come up with. And absolutely. It's, it's a one that just makes you go, Well, wow, that's yeah <laughs> it breathes life into the genre right and also it does. Makes it a little more serious so scott and i thought we would be clever and um <laughs> we thought that if there was a um zombie acopolis we would we would make up our own or zombie disaster i keep saying that word wrong sorry guys i have a bad speech impediment sometimes that fucks up my speaking but anyway um and what how we would survive so i guess should we each give a rule and go back and forth uh yeah okay yeah now say do you want me to start sure all right so the first one i put was first thing i'd want to do is find a weapon like a gun and a blunt force weapon because you want your gun for taking out zombies at a long range but you also want a blunt force weapon on you at all times for when you run out of ammo cool yeah mine was listen to the news and react so i went back to like because by the time you see them outside your front door that's almost too late if you're listening to the news or you're listening to the radio and you hear about shit happening, start to get prepared. Don't be like, oh, that's weird and change the station. <laughs> yeah, but that makes sense because I see I, I took this as like the apocalypse is already upon us. This is how you survive. Oh, so I'm going to survive. All right, next one. That's your next one. <laughs> All right. Next one was uh, fill a backpack with food that won't go bad, water, and medical supplies to always be prepared. Oh my God, we are so different. So you can tell how Scott is like the practical, like detailed person and I'm big picture. Assume the worst is my second rule. Oh. <laughs> so don't assume that this is happening somewhere else and that it's not going to get to you or it will blow over or you'll just go to a pub and have a pint and it will all blow over. Assume the worst and get ready. Yeah, like I said, I kind of took this as the apocalypse has already happened and this is how well, I got Well, yeah, survive. it would be happening. You would just hear about it. You're just yeah. assuming it's outside your front door. Yeah. I'm assuming that I've heard about it because I listen to the radio. <laughs> the uh, AM the, radio, anyway. Uh, the next one brings you into it a bit. Meet up with Heather and work together to survive. <laughs> it's not that you're going to drive to fucking... <laughs> I don't even have you on here yet. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was get supplies if possible. Food, gas, water, clothing, um... 
you know, make sure I, I have a weapon, um, make sure I'm prepared for stuff. All right. And then uh, the next one for me, find booze. Lots and lots of booze. <laughs> So you can get drunk and they don't chase you. That's really funny. I yeah. didn't actually put booze at all in mine, which is. Well, I figured if you and I are going to be surviving together, we're going to need booze to like either put up with both of our shit oh my God. and to just uh, like forget what's happening in the outside oh. of the world. Well, and we don't want to forget too much because then we die, but then maybe we yeah. come into zombies, right? So mine is be prepared to kill some fuckers. So I think I would have to put uh, myself that I may have to kill uh, some kids. I may have to like actually behead somebody like, cause it, like there's always those people, they hesitate. Right. So I'd have to be like, no, Heather shit's real. Now you got it. You got to fuck some bitches up. What's that makes sense. One? Right. What's your next one? My next one is keep on the move. Only stopping for sleep, eating and drinking. Yeah. Okay. Mine was always have an escape route. So whenever you go into a building or stuff, and I kind of stole this from zombie land, make sure you can get out. Yep. That right. makes sense. Uh, next one for me was find shelter in a defensible location. Oh, yeah. yeah kind of the same as me. My next one is don't be a dick. <laughs> I love it. Like, don't be an asshole. Like, don't be one of those people that are like, no, I won't fucking help you. Or what do you want? Well, obviously, if they're not turned, they want to fucking survive the same thing you want to do. So don't be an asshole. See, oh, God, mine is so, like, big picture thinking and yours is so, like, minute detail. I'm just like, yeah, don't be an ass, you know? <laughs> like, don't don't be treating people like shit when you come across them. Like better off to work together because plus if they're slower and weaker you can let them get taken down anyway that is true um for me uh the next one i went with was stay away from high population areas where infected could be so like cities oh that's a good idea that's really smart i said try to figure out the weaknesses of the zombies because every movie is different so i would yeah. try to be like is this a day it's like can they are they distracted by noise can they can they hear can they see um, you know, what is it that I can do to kind of better protect myself? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, for me, I went with uh, find a running vehicle. Okay, makes sense. I put travel in packs for yeah, other I, reasons that I've stated before. Right, which I'll, like kind of fits with the find a running vehicle yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, then I put find materials to build makeshift armor to protect you from bites. Oh, that's really smart. That's much nicer. I said worst case scenario, sacrifice the weakest member of the group, which I assume would be Scott. Oh, <laughs> damn it. You knew that was coming. All right. All right. This is what I kind of went a little bit funnier with, uh, and but kind of true too. Uh, try to find others and find someone to have consensual sex with because sex is a great <laughs> stress reliever and can help with keeping your mind sharp. You're so, <laughs> someone, someone that's going to die. Oh my God. You're like, it's <laughs> like every horror movie thing you don't do. Like, it took you to, like, 10 points to find a car. Not 10 points. 8 points to find a car, and then you're going to bang? Oh, my God, dude. <laughs> this is not the time for banging. Well, I mean, I got a car now, so it's easier to, like, pick up chicks, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay. Oh, my God. We're not traveling together. I've, I've left your group, okay? <laughs> I've officially left you behind um, and taken your car, like in Zombieland. So, number 10. If bitten, and I'm going to turn, do the following. If a dumb zombie... Find a safe area away from people, maybe some booze or some pot, maybe, and a nice place to walk around slowly in circles forever. If huh. evil, find ex-husband and everyone else who has wronged me, fuck shit up, go down fighting. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, so yeah, you, you went a lot more serious with yours compared to me. I did. But... I did. You probably thought I was going to be super goofy, but besides talking about sacrificing you, which I probably wouldn't do, um, unless you were already bitten, but at that point, it doesn't matter. Well, my next one will help you with that situation. Okay. So, if we have to run away from the zombies, have Heather run ahead to safety because she is the fastest. <laughs> and since I am slow and already have a bad knee, <laughs> I, I will stand back and distract the zombies and wow them with my awesome dance moves before getting taken down and killed. <laughs> you're synchronized dancing, and then you're yes. going to tell them, like, hold up, guys, did you know I almost went pro for magic? <laughs> They're going to be like, what? <laughs> and then that will give you plenty of time to get to safety, and I have done my job. I sacrificed myself to protect you. Oh, my God. You're such a good friend. Holy shit. I sound like such an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> my, my major dance moves. Would it be funny if they were like this was a comedy and they all thought you were you were just doing the macarena and you had a big bunch of them doing the macarena? That would be amazing. Then I find a way to control them and be like, oh, I got my right. own macarena and zombies you start now. Doing the thriller. <laughs> this is thriller. 
<laughs> anyway, so that was our, our, our top 10 rules on um, how Scott and I would survive a song. So, attack. and if, if anything, I would say follow Heather's rules because she took this <laughs> way ser- more serious than I did. <laughs> my favorite was if turn evil. And like, I honestly wouldn't go just find my ex-husband. That's more of a joke. But I would find people that wronged me and I would fuck shit up and I would go down fighting. <laughs> like I would go there. I I'd be that bitch where I was like, oh no, you fucking didn't. Right? Remember that time in grade six when you called me fat? <laughs> right? like, <laughs> everyone that had wronged me. So our final topic is where do we see zombie zombie movies going from here? What's next? I would love to see one where like they take a darker stance to it. Like maybe like it's a kindergarten class that gets turned and they're angry, you know, zombies and the kindergarten teacher or some teachers have to fight off with maybe some older kids and an older kid has to kill their younger sibling um, and make it more emotional, like trained to person kind of thing. Yeah, you, That's where I see this going. Yeah, you are uh, talking about a much darker version of Cooties. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess I'll have to see Cooties. Yep, because Cooties is about a bunch of uh, kids v- zombies because uh, the kids eat tainted chicken nuggets that turn them into zombies and it's at a elementary school and the teachers have to like survive against these like hordes of little elementary kids okay cool cool, but it's a comedy um but then yeah for me i see the zombie genre i want to see the zombie genre continue with the like more personal human stories like kind of what we've seen with the battery and like pony pool and ravenous um but i also see the genre especially after covid19 is gone and done I have a feeling we will see a lot more of like the virus infected style zombie movies coming Mm -hmm. back and probably seeing like, probably instead of like the aftermath, we will probably see more of like how people react in the beginning of the virus and seeing like how selfish people have become during like this whole entire time and like how helpful others had become. I have a feeling we'll see like a little more realistic look on what like happened in our world right now in a zombie film yeah i think we've gone away from comedy comedy zombie films except for the zombie land 2 um i think we're now like there was kind of that genre if we look at the real funny ones the late 2000s the 2004 to about 2013 with zombie land or no sorry zombie land came out in 2009 but um warm bodies in 2013 i think we're just going to really start to see stuff as we go along getting darker you know ravenous yeah. and um cargo and stuff like that are our reflection like little monsters i took out as well too but that's you know a little more cute and funny but i think you're right i think we will start to see more, a darker side of it for sure yeah i think that's pretty much what we have left to see at least for now and it'll probably go back to zombie comedies at some point but yeah. not for a while and while everything has its seasons right yeah so anyway thank you for joining us on our adventure to zombies and infected and how scott and i would suggest that you survive it was a lot of fun it was a it's a big topic and these episodes are getting longer and longer so um yeah hopefully you guys enjoyed the listen yeah i'll say this was a very fun episode to talk about it's a, it's a genre that's very well known but yeah i'm glad that we covered it because and we could probably cover it in a different way completely on another episode down the road. But we could. We we we, we could. <laughs> but I don't know if we would want to repeat ourselves. I'm just saying like there Scott's is a, like, I want to keep talking about zombies forever. No. I, <laughs> I'm good on that for now, but like I'm sure there could be other ways we could bring it back if we really wanted to. He says There's, he's good on that, but he just wants to find a way to bring up his synchronized dancing. Damn straight I do. Right. I'd like to check out these moves. <laughs> I'm just picturing like happy Peter! all these zombies like following you like not thriller i picture like something way more geekier than that and <laughs> i'd be like the pied piper of zombies can we get over the fact that you were all like i would try to save heather and i'm like mm, scott needs to die like <laughs> <laughs> which shows... isn't actually true I, I would i would do what i could to save people but if you got eaten i would shoot if you got bit i would shoot you yeah same just so we're clear you know well you probably I'd have a hard shoot. time doing it but i would do it i would do it I mean, have yeah, a hard no, time because I'd be I like, you, would... "You don't want to live this life, Scott. You're not about this zombie life, right? <laughs> You're not about this." Unless we were like super dumb ones that would just wander in circles all the time. Then it might be kind I of. I feel fun. like that's my life when I'm super high and drunk, anyway. So like, right. you know, I feel like that's not too different. <laughs> like we, um, you know, in my head I'm dancing, but I'm just actually staring and drooling. Um, <laughs> story of my life anyway on that note we look forward to our next episode i we have a bunch of topics so we'll see what we do next um 
And I'm glad you guys are doing it. Like doing it. Doing it. <laughs> glad you are doing it. Wow. it. Yeah. Doing it and doing it and doing it. Wow. I'm glad Represent you guys are queen. She was raised out in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Um, I'm really glad you guys are enjoying our episodes and some great feedback that we've gotten. Thank you so much for your kind words. I don't know, Scott, do you want to close this baby out? You got anything to add? Uh, no, I'll say I, you wrapped it up pretty well. So yeah, thank you everybody. And uh, until next time, unpleasant dreams. Thank you.